Well, good afternoon, uh, or whatever time of day it may be for you, wherever you are, uh, everybody. Um, and welcome to the Courtauld Centre for American Art, which is hosting this workshop on the important mid 20th century art historian, uh, Maya Shapiro. Uh, I'm David Peters Corbett, and I'm the director uh, of the centre here. Shapiro uh, bridged the worlds of artists and intellectuals in several ways. He was involved with Noam Chomsky, Walter Benjamin, Martin Heidegger, mentored Robert Motherwell, assisted Barnett Newman, inspired Fernand Leger. Shapiro's position between high art and high academe, however, has made him difficult to understand. Most scholarship about him isolates different aspects or moments of his life, his early Marxism, his forays into psychoanalysis, his relations with practicing artists, or his late semiotics. Stepping back, the workshop today seeks to draw inspiration from Shapiro's position in an uncertain middle ground. So in this seminar style uh, workshop, texts by Shapiro uh, have been accessible to members of the audience and participants by link. And I hope that uh, people have had a chance to look at those. The, spe the speakers will briefly in introduce the texts in short presentations so as to open up discussion later in the program. In a moment, I'll hand over to Oliver O'Donnell, who's organized the event and who will be the first presenter. But before I do so, I'd like to introduce all three of our speakers. Hagi Kanam is a professor of philosophy and chair of the philosophy department at Tel Aviv University. He specializes in 20th century continental philosophy, in aesthetics, and in the philosophy of art. He's the author of The Present Personal, Philosophy in the Hidden Face of Language, 2005, The Ethics of Visuality, Levinas and the Contemporary Gaze, 2013, and Photography and Its Shadow, 2020. His recent article, Maya Shapiro's Restitutions, offers a new reading of the famous debate between the art historian and the philosopher Martin Heidegger. Jeremy Kuring is Professor of Art History at the University of Fribourg. His fields of study are Italian Renaissance art, epistemology of art history, and anthropology of images. Among other publications, he's published Le Prince en Représentation, 2013, Andrea Mantegna, Making Art History, 2015, and with Yves Alain Bois, a special issue of October, devoted to Shapiro and Hubert de Miche. That's 2019. He's published an essay on Shapiro and drawing as epistemic tool in 2016, and is working on a book around the same topic. He also has a forthcoming book, Les Iconophages, Une histoire de l'indigestion des images, Actus Sud uh, 2021. Olivia o uh, Oliver O'Donnell is a research associate at the Warburg Institute, University of London, where he's a member of the Builder Farzoiga Group project. He's the author of Myra Shapiro's Critical Debates, Art Through a Modern American Mind, which I happen to have in front of me, which won the 2019 uh, Willibald Sauerländer Prize from the Zentral Institute for Kunstgeschichte. He's also the co-editor of the forthcoming volume, Art History Before English, Negotiating a European Lingua Franca from Vasari to the Present. Recent articles have appeared in journals such as History of Humanities, Word and Image, and Tate Papers. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Oliver, who's the first presenter, as well as the organizer, Oliver. Thank you so much, David, uh, for the warm introduction. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, for coming. Thank you to Acacia and Leila and everyone at the Research Forum uh, for helping make this event possible. Uh, many of you may remember that this event was actually scheduled to happen last year and we've had a few different moments of trying to reschedule it. Um, and I'm very happy to be able to have the event now. Um, and that so much work has gone into making it happen that I really just can't express my gratitude enough. I'd also like to thank um, all of the discussants who have been willing to join the, the conversation. Uh, in between the presentations, we'll, we'll put up um, 
a screen of video feeds with the people who've accepted the role of discussants, and that'll help create more of a workshop environment here as we uh, discuss, as we're intending to do, to intending to do um, Shapiro's essays that we've selected. So I will just start off first, share my screen. I will say before I get started here on this paper that um, we will have moderators for the discussion um, in between the presentations um, and that Hagi will uh, moderate my discussion after uh, my presentation and that I will then act as moderator um, following Jeremy and Hagi's presentations. So that'll just help us organize the questions in a way that's a little bit more suitable to the Zoom format. Okay, well, without further ado, I will begin. Between science and art in Meyer Shapiro's early thought. By directing our attention today to the work of Meyer Shapiro, we find ourselves following some old but formidable advice. Found in a letter of 4 May, 1938, none other than Theodore Adorno wrote to his now celebrated friend, Walter Benjamin that, quote, you should really establish contact with Meyer Shapiro, who is a great connoisseur of your writings, and in general, a man as informed as he is imaginative, though not exactly delicate. For example, when he explained to us that he considers your work on mechanical reproduction compatible with the method of logical positivism. I begin with this academically amusing anecdote, not only for its comic relief. Here, Adorno captures two qualities of Shapiro's thought that will be helpful for us to keep in mind throughout our workshop today. The tireless breadth of Shapiro's imagination, as well as his romantically optimistic, some might say naive, attitude about science. Surely, many here will have rhetorically asked already, if the writing of the Frankfurt School, which is notoriously critical of what its members saw as the instrumentalizing logic underwriting modern scientific practice, is nevertheless compatible with the science of logical positivism, then what could science possibly mean? My hope today is that through our workshop, we will get a little bit closer to answering that question, at least as the term pertains to Meyer Shapiro. Visual art will be unsurprisingly key. A fundamental part of Shapiro's understanding of science, of course, and a theme that many of you may have recognized to be conspicuously absent from the workshop's readings is Marxism, a mode of thinking to which Shapiro professed his allegiance to the end. Likely the most studied part of his career, Shapiro's Marxism is fundamentally wedded and intertwined with his legacy in the English-speaking world especially, where he's largely known as a central inspiration for what would become a dominant paradigm of research, vaguely known as the social history of art. And yet in all the extensive scholarship on and citations of Shapiro, including works by luminaries such as Linda Nochlin and T.J. Clark, very little attention has been paid to Shapiro's capacious understanding of science. A good part of this absence, I would submit, stems from what happened in Shapiro's later career, that is from the late 1960s to the early 1990s, the very period during which the social history of art began to assert its dominance. Parallel to this development came the rise of post-structuralism, which brought with it an embrace of more speculative modes of art historical inquiry, as well as a suspicion of what one famous book, remarkably dedicated to Shapiro, dubbed art history's coy science. If the connoisseurship, stylistic analysis, and iconographic studies that dominated art history in previous generations never went away, these disciplinary cornerstones only survived with a new shadow looming over them. Shapiro, many will remember, became a proverbial whipping boy during this moment, especially thanks to the work of Jacques Derrida, an episode to which Hagi will turn our attention later today. But in order to more fully understand Shapiro's tenacious conviction when faced with such a generational assault, I submit that we first have to understand and confront the much earlier and now seemingly distant historical time and place in which he forged his own identity. New York City before and after the Second World War. For it was there and then that Shapiro came to an understanding of what art, science, and Marxism had to do with each other. We start to get a sense of how Shapiro related art and science in his review of Emmanuel Levy's book, The Rendering of Nature in Early Greek Art, 
which you'll know is, was one of the readings and also happens to be Shapira's very first publication, appearing when he was just 22 years old. Here, science is an implicit theme, not mentioned by name, but very much part of the background to Shapira's retrospective assessment. Shapira's review of Louvi focuses on his explanation of the emergence of naturalistic sculpture in ancient Greece and how that explanation revolves around what Livy dubbed the memory picture, Erinnerungsbild, as a restraining force in artistic production. Many of you will know that this model was also a foundation of Ernst Gombrich's later theory of the place of visual schema within the creation of artistic naturalism, codified in famous phrases like making and matching and the beholder share in his 1960 book, Art and Illusion which is also heavily associated with Karl Popper's scientific theory of knowledge, of course. Part of what Shapiro's review of Louvi shows, as well as Shapiro's appeals to Louvi in his dissertation on Romanesque sculpture, is that this model of the memory picture was also fundamental to how Shapiro thought about the relation between art and knowledge or art and science. But crucially for Shapiro, this relation should not exclusively pertain to naturalistic images and the norms of artistic production that those images often bring with them. As we read, Shapiro criticizes Louvi's model for what he calls the biological fallacy under writing it. The confusion between development and progress. This criticism aside, Shapiro notes the power of the seven criteria of archaic art that Louvi codifies including stylization, isolation, flatness, and the reduction of three-dimensional forms to their broadest two-dimensional aspects. Shapira embraces these qualities as both a means of disinterested description and as a key to understanding what he calls aesthetic value. Specifically and revealingly, Shapiro hypothetically posits that the pleasure and satisfaction that underlies the aesthetic value or design in archaic art stems from a parallel or isomorphism between the order and rhythm in the form of such artworks and the order and rhythm of the mental images central to the physiology of vision. The closer the external physical sculpture's form is to the mental, internal mental image of its subject matter, the more efficient visual perception becomes and thus the more pleasurable the artwork supposedly is. This rather simple, perhaps naive, gestalt-like theory makes the standard of aesthetic judgment internal to the human mind and its processes, whereas the standard of aesthetic judgment within Livy, and by proxy Gombrich, is found in the external world, beyond the human mind, in its cultural conventions of depiction. By articulating and summarizing Shapiro's juvenile theory here, I'm not trying to defend it as correct. I have my doubts about it, as did Shapiro himself. You'll remember that in the review, he in fact is pretty non-committal about its truth, saying that the theory requires much further research, and it certainly does. Whatever the case, part of what makes the theory interesting to me is that it also resonates with how Shapiro conceived of the relation between artistic and scientific practice, and in a way that is notably different from the model of conjecture and refutation that we still associate with Livy, thanks in some ways to Gombrich's friendship with Popper, which of course was much later. Specifically, Shapiro's isomorphic theory allows him to connect aesthetic perception to scientific practice through what, me, through what we might call visual contemplation. It is, as if, it is as if the pleasure or satisfaction generated through the isomorphism between mental image and external form becomes a spur to curiosity about the external world and our pleasurable contemplation of it. In so doing, Shapiro locates a scientific attitude in what he would later call an aesthetic attitude, thereby identifying the origins of science, not in the naturalistic styles of Greek sculpture or Italian Renaissance painting, but rather in the highly refined formal schematic or archaic art that is found across the world. Examples of this, of course, include the Romanesque sculpture of Southern France that Shapiro studied throughout his life, as well as the modernism that dominated the artistic production of his milieu, which I illustrate here by way of de Kooning's woman woman, of course, and then on the right is actually a drawing by Shapiro, making his wife look very much like a Matisse. But the appeal of such artworks to Shapiro was much broader than their European context. 
as their so-called primitivism for him contained a key to knowledge in general. For Shapiro, the ubiquitous presence of schematic or archaic artistic production throughout human history and across highly diverse cultures testified to the fact that aesthetic contemplation and its correlate scientific knowledge were also global phenomena rather than Western ones. Codifying this idea in a later interview, Shapiro once described the work of artists as an important ingredient in the advance of science perception. Here, science seems to mean something like ciencia, visual know-how, and its meaning resonates with what Shapiro elsewhere described as critical seeing, a judicious form of vision that is self-aware and explorative. With this preliminary definition of Shapiro's science articulated, we can now turn to the second reading that I proposed, Shapiro's review of the New Vienna School, as this text reveals Shapiro's reaction to an alternative theory about the relation between science and art that was contemporary to him and that still resonates today. Published in the Art Bulletin in 1936, you see the cover of the journal there on the left. On the one hand, Shapiro appreciates the writing of the New Vienna School because he recognizes a kinship between their formalism and his own. Indeed, Shapiro and many New Vienna School writers both appealed to basic principles of Gestalt psychology in their writing. And because of this, Shapiro, Shapiro carried out lifelong exchanges with several of them, notably Fritz Novotny and Otto Pecht. However, Shapiro also strongly objects in his review to the division that Hans Edelmeier in particular makes between a first and second science of art. The former being something like basic documentation and description, the latter being some kind of deeper or higher understanding. And I illustrate this by way of, I illustrate Zedelmeier's theory by way of these two paintings by Bruegel and Cezanne because they are paintings that Zedelmeier interpreted, although not in the readings we did today. Zedelmeier's distinction, which Shapiro correctly points out, is based on long-standing theories, often associated with figures like Heinrich Rickert and Wilhelm Diltai, concerning the so-called explanation of the natural sciences versus the so-called understanding of the humanities, divides knowledge up when Shapiro was trying to unite it by grounding knowledge in basic human capacities. Much like Shapiro's objection to Livy and the implicit, if unintended, Western bias that Livy's theory of naturalism contained, Shapiro objected to Zettelmeier's second science of art because it created a chasm in knowledge that was based on cultural conventions. This in turn helps explain why Shapiro was so involved with the unity of science movement, which in his mind very much paralleled his Marxist commitments. Today, of course, art historians often look askance at that movement because it is easily understood to wash over or even disallow cultural difference and to create a hierarchy between natural science and humanities that is unpalatable. And here I illustrate this by way of an example on the left of Otto Neurath's famous isotypes with which Shapiro was intimately familiar. The irony of this bad reputation is that it fails to recognize progressivism that was foundational to Shapiro's participation in the unity of science movement. It fails to recognize how Shapiro appealed to the unifying arguments of science to democratize our historical knowledge and open up the discipline to fields of inquiry that had been previously excluded. Indeed, Shapiro frequently made the point that in his youth, African sculptures like the Yoruba palace door you see in the center there were relegated to ethnographic collections and studied by ethnographers rather than held in art museums and studied by art historians. For Shapiro, the inclusion of such works in arts history was a hard won achievement and it was animated by ideals of social justice, by the belief that artworks like these were intimately connected to forms of knowledge that were anything but naive. Though we can certainly fault Shapiro for failing to fully articulate what that knowledge was, and though Shapiro's framing of that knowledge through concepts like form creates further problems, such shortcomings should not blind us to the cultural leveling impulse that nevertheless motivated him. Shapiro, in fact, was admirably aware of the failures of his own formalism. In 1943, already, he wrote, as long as our relation to the arts of foreign peoples is contemplative, they do not serve to unite us. For the meaning of their art to them being practical and an element of a culture to which they cling is not shared by us. And its significance to us being a part of our culture is in a similar way unavailable to them. It's only when we attempt to participate in their life or they in ours 
when we acquire common aims, that the arts can become a means of mutual understanding. In relation to my presentation today and the readings we've done, Shapiro's foregrounding here of the mutual participation necessary to establish true intercultural understanding raises many questions, including the place of action within Shapiro's concept of science, as well as how we in the present should engage with cultural objects produced in the distant past. It also reminds me of the global modernist artistic practices that were growing up around Shapiro and that are attracting more and more attention today. Might some of the highly diverse modernist artists of Shapiro's world in their interconnection with each other across continents and cultures serve as a better model for what this mutual participation might be? I'd leave that as an open question. However, we might answer it. I would hope that as art history continues to throw off previous biases and extend its knowledge into ever more remote and neglected corners of the past, Shapiro's example can serve as a powerful reminder a reminder of the hope for unity to which he aspired, as well as of the mutual participation that is still very much needed. Thank you very much. That's my presentation. And now I'm going to stop the share of my screen, switch it back over to gallery view, and we can begin the discussion. So hi, everyone. Let's open the floor for discussion. Um, I might kick things off. <laughs> um, thanks, Oliver. That was great. And I wanted to kick things off, perhaps, before we get lost in the weeds um, of the readings, which I'm excited to do with you and with everyone here. If I wanted to ask if perhaps you could open up the discussion by speaking a bit more about intellectual history and specifically your approach to not just this object, not just objects from the past, but art historians from the past. Um, I do really see today's event as coming from your book um, and the kind of close reading that you're offering is in line with the conclusion at the end of your book when you suggest that we might be able to read Shapiro anew. Um, and I wonder if you could speak a bit about the selection of the readings today, why you've selected them, and actually how through the selection we might read this art historian anew. Sure, yeah, sure. That's a great question, Chloe. Thank you. Um, my so we selected the readings together, Hagi, Jeremy, and I, and I selected my readings after they selected theirs. Um, Hagi has a, a more focused interest in Shapiro, specifically on, uh, on phenomenology, and this had in Shapiro's relation to phenomenology, and this has led him, understandably, to focus on this um, debate with Heidegger, as well as Shapiro's relationship with Merleau Ponty. Um, and so the readings he selected relate to his interest. Um, in that topic. Um, Jeremy has this interest in Shapiro's drawing practice, an example of which I included there, but it's a very diverse um, and uh, really impressive drawing practice just by how much is left over and saved in his archive. And so he's gonna speak about readings that relate specifically to that topic. Um, given those two selections, I wanted to select texts that kind of filled in some of a more comprehensive view of Shapiro. So that's why I selected the Lovie Review and the New Vienna School Review, because they're from earlier in his career. Um, and since Hagi and Jeremy were speaking about texts from after the war, in fact, quite late in Shapiro's career, I thought, well, we, to get a more balanced understanding of Shapiro, we should read some stuff from early in his life. Um, I also wanted to select texts that weren't these classic Marxist texts, um, which are endlessly debated, as you know, the, the social basis of art and the nature of abstract art, these two articles from the 36 and 37, because those are the two articles that I think most people read um, by Shapiro. And so he's very heavily associated with this moment of, of kind of anti-Stalinism really in the left in American intellectual debates about art, I suppose you could say. Um, but he's really is a much more diverse figure than that. Um, and I think yeah, so I wanted to try to fill in the picture a little bit. Um, 
in terms of art history's relationship with intellectual history, I suppose already there in my explanation of which text I wanted to select, you've already gotten a sense um, of where I'm coming from. I, I, you know, I, I'm trying to get a sense more of like the broad, the broad parallels, the broad genealogies that might be um, used to connect these two areas of research, which are often treated kind of as separate, even though they're intimately connected. Um, and my interest in Shapiro, I think, as you know, it also stems from this fact that, you know, he's, um, as is clear in the workshop description, right, he's, he's really connected both with both worlds, the world of artists and the world of intellectuals. Um, and since we as art historians effectively are both, although maybe we're more intellectuals than art practicing artists ourselves, although maybe some people here are practicing artists, you know, we, we often rely on on words, right? We, we rely on critical language in order to make our explanations. Um, so it's felt to me like a bit more of a self-conscious engagement with that intellectual history can of course help us today, but also help us understand the art of Shapiro's time. I, I would just say that the provocation in the back of my mind when you were speaking then is that it's less a kind of reading him anew uh, because then we would perhaps have read those classic texts, but yeah. it's kind of finding the less read corners or reading aspects that are hitherto unexplored, um, rather than kind of reframing everything in that way. Um, so I guess, is it a question of reorienting the Shapiro discourse or are you rewriting the whole um the whole discourse well my, my sense is that the way those two classic texts that we didn't read social social basis of art and the nature of abstract art these were really read and came to the fore right in these debates within the social history of art right specifically between people like tj clark and andrew hemingway that's the most I think probably noted exchange. Um, and so they became in effect um, texts used to kind of talk about the place of Marxist thinking within art history. Um, and of course, they're very effective at doing that because Shapiro was a committed Marxist at the time, went through this, you know, the Moscow trials, learned about it through the Dewey Commission, had very, you know, strong convictions about it. Um, but Shapiro was also a much longer lived figure than 1936-37. So there, there's a certain reframing of Shapiro's as a more holistic figure that I think I'm trying to accomplish. Um, and, then I, and that also explains my selection of these texts from earlier in his career to try to frame him more holistically. Um, yeah. Uh, Hi, sorry, can I ask? Yeah, Stephen, please, Stephen. Hi, Oliver. Yeah, thanks for that. That was really, really interesting. Um, something that struck me as interesting reading the text, the uh, Greek nature one, was, I, th I seem to, maybe I misremembered this, but Shabira uses this phrase about the sphere of imaginative values. Is that right? And it just reminded me of what Roger Fry and his essays in Vision and Design, where he makes distinctions between the imaginative reality and, and, and then sort of <clears throat> advocating modernist art. So it struck me that his critique of Louis seemed to be shaped by some of these kind of formalist ideas. And also in the critique of the Farnese bull sculpture, where he kind of critiques the, the excess of ornament and the forms are not kind of schematized enough. So it's like a sort of a Clive Bell, Roger Fry type critique of that sculpture. I just don't know if he was reading Fry at the time or in these early years, he was perhaps influenced by some of those sort of ideas. It's a good question, uh, Stephen, and it's a good um, reading, a good accurate recognition. Uh, he was very in influenced by Fry in the 20s in particular, um, and that essay right is from 25, so it's right in the period when he's reading Fry most heavily. Um, there are other texts by Shapiro from the 20s which reveal, I think, his reading of Fry a little, a little bit more. Um, specifically, he wrote this kind of overview of um, modern art um, for an encyclopedia um, on, it was a kind of introductory text um, for undergraduates. Um, and in this overview of modern art, um, he really appeals to 
I mean, he even uses the phrase significant form um, in the text. Um, um, and other Fry-like terms come up sporadically in Shapiro's writings. Um, so it's definitely there. And to was he in contact with Fry at any point? To my knowledge, he was not in contact with Roger Fry and they never exchanged um, letters or, or anything. Um, I think some of his reading of Fry also comes indirectly. So there's people like Willard Huntington Wright, who was a, an artist and an art writer in New York and in America, uh, who was a kind of Fry follower, I guess you could say. Um, and I know Shapiro read some of Wright's books. Um, and so there's a certain, there's a direct and an indirect connection. But of course, that's also speaks for, pretty forcefully, I think, to the art world, at least the, the New York art world and the London art world right in the 20s. There's Fry's dominance is pretty um, noteworthy. Could I, ask, could I ask a question? Please, Karen. Okay. So I'd like to turn because your question is how did um, Shapiro, what does science mean to Meyer Shapiro? But of course, we are dealing with works of art. So already we have a sort of resistance in the art object to perhaps to what might, what might, one might think of as science or the knowing that science can deliver. And already in this first, his earliest publication, um, the review of, of Louis, he writes, sculpture employs visual facts, but all these visual facts cannot equal the work of art. And then in the Vienna School Review, he writes, it's near the, about the near impossibility of scientifically rigorous explanation. And so what do, how do we want to think about then this idea of science's know-how for him, which includes a rigor um, and um, a critical seeing, but on an object which ultimately cannot be known. And it seems that he's really getting to the crux of that, which is art history in, this, in these two very early works. So I wonder if you would like to comment upon that, or if you could comment on that, please <laughs> shed some light on that for us. Yeah, I mean, I, th those are great passages, Karen. Thank you for um, bringing them to our attention. Um, do, do you have any thoughts about it? Because I, I'm, on the one hand, I think it's, they're great passages, but I'm not sure um, that I, can necessarily address them directly. And I also feel like it would be nice if we could make this more of a, a true conversation between people and mm -hmm. not just me talking um, um, to everyone. Well, in it's interesting in that, in that early article, the first one, the review of Louis, where he says, we have to await perhaps a developed theory of forms in order to answer the questions that he proposes. And of course, Henri Faucillon publishes his, The Life of Forms in French in 1934. And in that book, he says, no matter all of the things that we might know about history and learn about history, it will never give us the towers of Léon. Mm. So always there is in the work of art, this resistance or this, this aesthetic aspect, which, which can't be, um, ultimately known by facts. It can be experienced by us, but perhaps can't be, you know, uh, pinned down. So I think, and then to get back to Shapiro's Marxism, and you're, of course, the expert in all of this, um, Oliver, I'm not, but it, it, I think it's very nice if we can recuperate this early moment of Shapiro because he's always, always thinking about the work of art, the power of the work of art, how it connects to history. And so sometimes a kind of Marxist reading can uh, reduce that tension or perhaps make of it a more tight fit than he is willing to, than he himself allows. He allows for an elasticity between that relation of art and history and an excavation of it and a critical, a critical um, probing, a constant pr critical probing of that. And that will come through in, in the essays that we're reading later on, of course, where he goes against Wittgenstein and he argues against Heidegger and so on. But um, it, it seems to me that one of the things that he's concerned about is that we don't fall into traps, that we don't fall into categories, you know, 
in first instance. So his motivation is always to kind of open up which he did with the Romanesque and so on and so on. So um, those are just some thoughts, but uh, other people should speak. I've spoken enough already. <laughs> yeah, Maggie, please. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking that um, this um, division or uh, hopefully non-division between science and art parallels very much the, the linguistic versus, you know, the iconic or the image and how that he was always trying to kind of juggle both at the same time or mm -hmm. try to, you know, use a sort of semiotic model, but a semiotic model that was not, you know, the Saussurean you know, a conventional sign, but one that had to do with the trace and uh, the index and so on. In other words, ones that were more physically um, in touch mm -hmm. <laughs> with the world rather than this conventional sign. So it's kind of like a pattern in his thought of that, um, um, trying to merge these opposite or seemingly opposite poles. I'd like to follow up on that. Um, I, I completely agree that, I mean, the question of the relationship between the discursive, say, and the visual, or as he put it, the linguistic and the iconic is, is very central to uh, Shapiro. And it's clear also that you can find his, him saying things on both sides. At, at times, there's a clear distinction between the discursive and the and the visuals say that's why say philosophers can't really understand kind of say something important about art. And at other times, as you just mentioned, he tries to 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 overcome uh, these distinctions. And I I'm just opening it up for discussion, and also would be happy to hear Oliver on that. I mean, is it like a bipolar attitude towards the question or is there really an effort to do some kind of conceptual work that would allow us on the one hand to be able to hold a distinction and yet somehow or not at least not to allow it to collapse and yet not to be too strict about it and see how the concreteness say of language can be part of the visual and and vice versa I, I wish I had an answer to that question, Hagi. I really do. Um, Can I say something here? Please, Sarah, Yeah, please. I, I, um, I'm very uh, interested in this word image business, of course. But what I don't understand is, bearing in mind his relationship with Jacobson and Levi-Strauss and everything, the idea of language, as opposed to visual language, is always taken as a kind of given and a kind of transparency, even though there's the whole history of language and how um, I've just been reading some of your chapters Oliver and there's Berenson's quote about how we ought to um, you know discover uh, more about Jewish literature although we'll never get close to comprehending it there's a difference between so I don't know who's another word and then we won't ever comprehend it but there never seems to me uh, either in in um, what I've read or in Lieta to be actual think about the worldview of people who spoke, you know, Mozarabic or um, whatever one was speaking in medieval Germany or whatever, and how their language structures impinged upon um, their um, visual expressions. Um, I, was, I was taught Anglo-Saxon uh, based on the visual model of a 1930s Latin primer with no cultural history and no visual history. And it seems to me there's an, almost a kind of inversion going on where the actual language, I mean, this would be my challenge to all medieval art history or Renaissance art history or anything. Whereas we can perfectly well accommodate ourselves to American language um, of the 20th century, say, even though in many ways, even in terms of its poetry, it's far more pragmatic than other language. There seems to me a fundamental problem about language per se. Uh, and the um, 19th century disciplines of linguistics are just as rich as the 19th century disciplines of art history or anthropology. So I don't know, that's a big one, but it does seem to be something unaddressed through these texts. 
in terms of what they presume is understandable and what they presume is not understandable and has to be excavated almost archaeologically. Well, I think the, um, I mean, the, the linguistic relativity theses that are often associated with people like Sapir and Worf and were both students of Boaz, right? Um, whose work is often used to talk about how, and here I'm interpreting what you said, um, Sarah, you know, historical languages, in fact, shape the way people saw the world. Um, and therefore, in order to really uh, understand their artistic production, we have to kind of deeply immerse ourselves um, in their languages and to try to understand their, their worldviews. Um, this research, I think, was not, I don't think Shapiro was familiar with this research, despite the fact that he did study with Boaz, who was the mentor of both um, Sapir and Worf. Um, he may have been familiar with it, but um, my sense is that the, the intellectual history that brings this type of thinking into art history is actually a later moment, I think, especially about Michael Baxendahl's work um, um, on the languages of art history, um, which are quite explicitly indebted to um, Worf and Sapir in this tradition of thinking. I think Shapiro had a, had a more, had a belief about language that was more transparent, just he had a, had a belief about aesthetic experience, which was in some ways more transparent. Oh. Um, it, it was more kind of universalist in a way. Uh, and for better or worse, um, I think that's kind of part of his historical formation. So I don't mean to defend it as kind of correct. Um, I think today it, it feels um, a little bit one way or a little bit of a one way street um, in comparison to the way um, people are, I guess, people, art historians today think, I, and I use the word one-way street because another letter Adorno calls Shapiro an Einbahnstrasse, a one-way street, <laughs> which is uh, another way that I think even today people think about the science art relation, that science is this kind of one-way street and, um, and art and the humanities are trying to be a little are more po polyvalent and more uh, pluralistic. Um, so this is the kind of rambling response to your question, Sarah. Sorry if I not that I just did. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I could come in here. I mean, again, another sort of rambling response, but on this question of transparency and, and the way I think it takes us back quite sort of to the heart of the, the, the tension between the historical and the philosophical and what those categories mean and when they become static and when they are dynamic and when they, you know, kind of when they solidify into certain ideas of their own formalism and when they're in touch with the kind of material specificity of works. Um, I was thinking about the initial quote by Adorno um, and uh, wondering if you can come back to that and if there's some sort of interesting ways to open up the relation between Benjamin and um, Shapiro on, with respect to Benjamin's um, review of the rigorous, um, uh, the rigorous uh, study of art. Um, and, and thinking about, if I remember right, and I'm sure people will remember better than me, but the idea in that essay, um, the kind of pivot point for Benjamin about the, the kind of the insignificant or what he, um, what he calls the esteem for the uh, insignificant um, that he identifies in, in uh, I think he's talking about Pecht, Siddlmeyer, and uh, owing their to, to, to Regal and something to do with the way meaning content is tied to material content, but material content is always including its own significance. And this being the way of, I guess, disrupting that kind of transparency. So, I mean, I'm, I don't really have a question here, but I'm just wondering about that, that kind of disjunction between Benjamin and, and um, Shapiro with respect to these two reviews and whether that might offer <laughs> some way into to reframing um, some of these questions of uh, over de determinism and universalism as a form. Well, I wouldn't want to say anything about Benjamin here, um, especially because I, one of the reasons I wanted to invite Stefan Haug was because he's really much more informed about Benjamin than I am. I'm not sure if Stefan's still here with us, but um, I would certainly defer to him. Um, to maybe respond to your question, Kamini, about um, this opposition in some ways between Shapiro and Benjamin. Uh, no, thank you. I, I don't really know if, if it's an opposition, but I thought more of what both maybe 
have in common, and this is a close relation between their philosophies. So Benjamin tries much less to be formalistic and contemporary art, and that both really tie their, their thoughts very much to the art of their time and, and certain artworks. And th this is one that in the, in the first sentence of, um, of Maya Shapiro in the, in, in the text on Löwy, he writes like, we have rereading Löwy's texts, we become aware of how much the modern arts have changed of view on the arch archaic and the primitive. So this awareness that the view on history is very much shaped by the own perspective and by the own time. This is something that connects Benjamin and Maya Shapiro very much. And I was thinking more about the correspondences between the two, but maybe the differences are equally interesting. I, I, I must say that uh, I, I didn't know the quote you brought, uh, Oliver, from Adorno. I thought it's something like a personal joke or something. I mean, because I what, it is, yeah. what could be more distant than than Benjamin and logical positivism? So, and that goes together with Adorno saying that he's both not so delicate and the imagination there has kind of a role. So that that was a very nice quote. I wonder what you thought about it, really, and other people. I was, um, I'm still processing a bit myself. You know, I, I first read it in, um, in the English translation. And uh, just recently, I, I, I looked up the German um, and the way it's translated in the um, English Adorno Benjamin correspondence is actually slightly different from that. Um, and in some ways, the, the, the German, I think, is a bit more positive. I, I tried to retranslate it a bit. Um, but um, you know, there, there, were, there were real tensions between um, the Frankfurt School and Shapiro, just as there were, there was lots of um, positive resonances between them and they did collaborate. Um, but if you read, um, you know, some of the other correspondence or other comments that kind of come up in passing between them, it's clear that there were, you know, tensions. Um, uh, in, one, in some letters, Shapiro uh, describes Adorno and Horkheimer as being kind of whining critics of Western society. Um, and well, I already mentioned this other letter from where Adorno calls Shapiro an Einbahnstrasse, uh, which I thought was interesting. Um, the way that I have tried to um, make sense of some of these differences um, is by way of a distinction that, that uh, Martin Jay made in his book, uh, Songs of Experience, uh, between what he calls the, the Marxist crisis of experience versus the pragmatist um, cult of experience. And it seems to me that Shapiro, um, despite his Marxism, in some ways is closer to the pragmatist cult of experience. He's really committed to it as this kind of realm of knowledge creation, uh, this kind of moment of, in some ways, a kind of transparent moment where, where knowledge production is possible. Whereas I, you know, in the Frankfurt School especially, um, experience is something really to be looked at with a skeptical eye. Um, a much more cynical worldview, I think. Um, so that's one way that I've tried to make sense of it. Uh, Karen, I think you're muted still. Um, but I was going to say, Oliver, do you think that applies equally across time for Shapiro? I think- In the sense of the 20th century, he would have felt the impact of those, surely. Felt the impact of, of what? Of the events of the 20th century. <laughs> yeah, no, he certainly did. Um, so you're asking, do you think that he, had, he maintained the same attitude towards experience yes. throughout? Yes, yes. I think there's a moment in the mid thirties. I mean, Shapiro really only, only turns to Marx in 1930. So the writing from his from the twenties, like the Livy Review, one of the reasons why Marx is conspicuously absent is that he hadn't really started to read the Marxist tradition yet. It's really with the stock market crash in 29 and, and that moment that turns that he then turns to Marx. And in the mid 30s, he's a, he is a very, very rigorously committed Marxist. I mean, he votes for the Communist Party, um, the American Communist Party in the elections. Um, and I think in that moment, um, 
I think his attitude about experience would be different. Um, but I think from later on, from already in like 37, 38, um, once he starts to sympathize with the Dewey Commission's findings about Trotsky, and once the, uh, you know, the, the, the Moscow trials happen and anti-Stalinism really starts to take off among American intellectuals, I think one of the ways that Shapiro um, in some ways saves his, 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 his view of, um, uh, of modern art even um, is by in some ways being more optimistic about what artists can do with experience and how they can represent um, their experience in art. Um, but that goes hand in hand though, wouldn't you say with a crisis in experience, meaning that he will also talk about abstract expressionist painting and so on as a kind of crisis. So even if you, if he retains the variable of experience and that is important to him, it could also be a crisis of experience that is his understanding of experience, if you see what I'm saying. No, oh, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think, you know, the, the writing on the Abex artists from the late 50s, right? This is um, in many ways positions Abex paintings as being testaments, right? Of some type of crisis. Um, but nevertheless, right? The title that that essay was given incidentally not by Shapiro is the liberating quality of the avant-garde, right? So it's a quite, it, even if he's framing these, these Abex paintings as protest paintings, as paintings that are kind of speaking to a crisis in American society, he's still seeing them in some ways very optimistically as in some ways being able to kind of speak about this and achieve a certain perspective on it that is, um, I, at least I see as positive, as a kind of ch champion in some ways, rather than a, a cynic. Oliver, there are a, a few uh, questions from the audience, but before we go to them, just an anecdote apropos Benjamin, uh, to remind you that, um, uh, and, and the Frankfurt School, that, that Shapiro was in, in Europe in, the, in 39, and he was asked by the, by the members of the Frankfurt School who were in New York to try and convince Benjamin to, to come to America after their attempts failed. And they had a very significant meeting, but Benjamin refused to Americanize. Yes, and I think that that episode in some ways is already behind some of Adorno's language in the quote that I read. Um, May I say something about this? Oliver? Please, Jeremy, please, yes. There is a, a little note uh, in the archive wrote by Adorno, and this note uh, combines two address, uh, Benjamin address in Paris and uh, Krakauer address in Paris. And uh, Shapiro uh, was, in, in a way, um, he has a mission to, to contact them just before the, the um, to find a way to, to help them to, to leave Paris and France. And uh, we know uh, Benjamin never, uh, never succeed to do it, uh, but Krakawa uh, made it. And this note is just two addresses uh, in Paris. Uh, and I recognize the, the uh, the way I don't know wrote uh, in this letter to, to Shapiro uh, and it's a very moving uh, uh, yes trace of, of this connection between the two mm. but it's just to say that because uh, to yeah um, um, to continue on this on this uh, topic um, you know, in, in the quote of the letter that I read from Adorno to Benjamin, the word uh, is, is Einfallsreich, which I translated as imaginative, but can also be translated as like, um, what's the word? What, what's another way of translating Einfallsreich? It's like not just imaginative, but kind of res resourceful maybe, right? Um, and, and sometimes I wonder, Maybe a what maybe that's part of what Adorno is speaking about in the letter. He's saying introduce yourself to Shapiro, not just because he's you know an informed and imaginative man, but also because he has the resources mm -hmm. to get you out of Paris. So there's a kind of um, uh, well, maybe not to make maybe not to make too much of this, but there's a kind of instrumentalization that's kind of part of part of what's behind their relationship there. 
Um, Hagi, you're, you're muted still. Would you like to take the written questions? Would you like me to read them to you? Or can you read them? Oh, I, I see them, yeah. Um, we have a bunch here. We have um, Johannes asks, following up on the passage you quoted by Shapira about arts of foreign people, I wonder whether you could say briefly something about Shapira having or not having a sense of something like foreign periods. Ooh, especially against this, yeah. So this is a question kind of about Shapiro's kind of reading of modernism into the medieval past, but in effect, um, his use of modernism as a kind of unifying framework. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, it's certainly something that more recently, you know, scholars, I think more recent generations have really criticized Shapiro for, for being in some ways, um, um, a little bit too unifying in his approach to history, that he's kind of so committed to the modernist project that he's not allowing for enough historical uh, differentiation. Um, the quote that I read is from an essay of his published posthumously. Um, it's in, this is the book of posthumous essays of his, this is the fifth volume of his selected papers, um, all published by his, his widow. Um, and the essay is called The Fine Arts and the Unity of Mankind. Um, and it's, well, as the name suggests, it's all about trying to think about visual art as a kind of gateway in some ways towards mankind, uh, some kind of collective sense. Um, I suppose that's what I'll say about that. Um, his first language was Yiddish, that's true. Um, Murray Rosen, hello, Murray. Murray asks, can I speak a little bit more about global modernism and art as a means of mutual understanding and the difference between linguistic explanation and artistic expression perception? How does cultural diversity relate to linguistic artistic communication? Well, that's a huge question, Murray. Um, I, I'm not sure that Shapiro had a good answer to that. In fact, I'm pretty sure that he failed to answer that question. Um, um, as I answered to Sarah's question earlier, I think Shapiro's attitude towards language was, was not, not quite in tune with the way we think about um, linguistic relativity today. Um, and then there's a very long question here, um, which maybe would be easier for me to read over a break and then to respond to. I feel like it might take a while for me to get through it. Okay. Um, but we are coming up on three. So this would, if there's no immediate questions now, we could take a break now and maybe come back at, at five past uh, for Jeremy's presentation. Maybe that uh, makes sense. Okay, definitely. Great, so, okay, thank we'll, you very much. Thank you, everyone. So I'll see you at five past three. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, uh, Oliver, for your invitation. And, and David, and I'm very happy to be here and, and to discuss about Shapiro's drawing. After Oliver O'Donnell's valuable comments on Shapiro, Levy, and the New Vienna School, and in the wake of some of the problems already discussed, especially the linguistic iconic issue, I would like to draw attention to two other texts by Shapiro on some problems in the semantics of visual art and on representing and knowing. The first one is well known. The second, on the other hand, is almost completely ignored. The choice of these texts rests for me on a very particular point. They both shed light on the epistemic function of drawing for the academic practice of art history. As such, they are of great importance for my own research Indeed, for several years, I have been investigating drawing as an epistemic tool in art history, and the Shapiro case occupies a special place in this study. Let us recall, as it is certainly not known by all those who are listening, that Mayor Shapiro drew all the time, all the time. Drawing became an essential tool in his research, a sort of pass to understanding the world and the works of art. But before coming to this epistemic practice of drawing, I first briefly present the two texts, highlighting 
a few points on which it seems to me necessary to focus. First, on some problems in the semiotics of visual art. This famous essay, presented at a conference in Kazimierz Poland in 1966, before being published first in Semiotica in 1969, and then in the journal Simulus in 1972, marked a turning point in the history of art. Indeed, it is one of the first essays, if not the first, to clearly address the problems of the visual semiotics by seeking to identify analytical tools that are specific to the study of visual arts and that make it possible to account for what he calls the non-mimetic elements of the image, image sign and their role in constituting the sign. That is, the arrangement of forms, the ground, the frame, the format, top and bottom, left and right, etc. This text is remarkable because it manages not only to hold together cultural singularities and structural invariants, but also to offer criteria of analysis that can be applied to both figurative and abstract art because Shapiro studies visual elements independently of their possible referential function. Facing these proposals, most of the studies devoted to this essay consider Shapiro's argument in the perspective of the linguistic turn of the 60s. In fact, the article contains no footnotes and is quite tempting to speculate on the author's theoretical sources. However, it must be emphasized that Shapiro succeeds precisely in proposing a new approach by taking a step aside from linguistic semiotics. If Shapiro's argument is obviously indebted to philosophy and linguistics, its, originally, its originality also, and perhaps even more importantly, comes from his knowledge of artistic practice and the formal problems he himself faced. Symptomatically, to justify a certain number of, of points in his demonstration, Shapiro sometimes used in his article the relatively unscientific expression, as every artist knows. In the margins of the linguistic perspective, it is the artistic practice that enables him to assert that, I quote, the qualities of the image substance, as every artist knows, are not altogether separate from the qualities of representative objects. A thicker outline makes the figure look more massive. A thin line can add to its delicacy and grace. A broken line opens the form to the play of light and shadow with all their expressive implications for the concept of things. In a, in a corresponding way, the visible patching of pigment in an impressionist work contributes to the general effect of luminosity and air. Both poles of substance, the ancient and the modern, enter into the visual manifestation of the whole and convey peculiarities of outlook and feeling as well as subtle meanings of the science." End quote. I think this assertion should be taken very seriously. Knowledge can indeed emerge from artistic practice. This sensitive, formal and artistic approach to visual semiotics finds resonance in the second text submitted for your reading on representing and knowing. Published for the first time in 2000 in a book devoted to Shapiro's artistic work, this text is the result of a lecture given in the early 60s. This is a brief reflection to counter Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein's statement that, as quoted by Shapiro in his article, one can only draw what one knows. Wittgenstein's assertion is in fact reported by his student Norman Malcolm in his 1958 book, Ludwig Wittgenstein, a memoir. And the said statement is formulated in a slightly different way. I quote Wittgenstein as quoted by Malcolm. I can hardly paint at all unless I know what physical objects I am painting. We know from a letter sent to Berdamisch on October 5, 1972, that this statement was precisely the one discussed by Shapiro when he met Malcolm for the first time. And I quote the letter. The text of Wittgenstein, you will be interested to hear, is precisely the one that I brought up when I met Malcolm at Ithaca in 1962. I think he was not happy with my questions and criticism of Wittgenstein on this point. 
I argued, I argued then that one can represent an object one doesn't know and that drawing is a method of discovery of visual properties of the object. Shapiro thus insists here on the epistemic autonomy of drawing. And this idea is precisely what he sets out in the text on representing and knowing. According to Shapiro, the graphic practice stitches to see and gives a knowledge that is difficult to gain by other means. He illustrates this dem his demonstration with the example of the representation of a Lavin cell's molecules, of which he writes, I quote, the most remarkable achievement of contemporary science has been the discovery of the shape and components of the molecules of the Lavin cell, a discovery that provides a visual model of the unseen arrangement and thereby permits certain inferences about the process of replication in living matter. It is true that one can draw this model only because ingenious and passionate scientists have made extensive observations and deductions. But the diffraction patterns formed on a screen had first to be drawn before the determining molecular structure could be known. One knew what a diffraction pattern was, but the system that produced this particular pattern could only be discovered through the precise tracing and study of the newly disclosed pattern. Further down in the same text, he explained that learning here, learning to draw is the process of acquisition of devices which enable one to represent all objects, known and unknown. In order to draw them, it is not necessary to know what they are, but rather, rather how to reproduce the appearance of their form, the surface, their volume, their texture, their position in space in relation to other objects in the same space. To draw the much discussed duck rabbit in order to elicit the ambiguous effect, one must know how to draw. This applies to all illusion producing forms. One can spoil the experiments with geometrical figures if they are not drawn correctly. Experience in drawing is not of individual objects, but of features common to all visible objects. Wittgenstein's mistake was to ignore the universals in representation which are also the universals in perception. A few years later, in 1969, Shapiro developed this idea during a conference at the New York studio, saying that, and I quote, as you draw the single object, you have to construct forms and acquire a knowledge of relationships which hold for all objects. That is, you must know what a boundary is, what a shadow is, what light is, what the difference is between something above, below, and in the middle, side, and center. You build up all the practical categories in your medium of charcoal, pencil, and so on. All the practical categories of representation which apply a great variety of objects. And thanks to that, he continues, when you see an object that you have never seen before, as though looking through a microscope and observing some strange organism or tissue, you already know how to relate lines to each other. By defending this idea, Shapiro stands out and succeeds in subtracting the visual empire from the imperialism of logos. But it doesn't do it by denying the importance of language. Shapiro engages with the linguistic paradigm. His knowledge in the fields of linguistics and semiotics was far from rudimentary since he refers, particularly in his correspondence with Hubert Damisch, to De Saussure, Jacobson, Benveniste, Barthes, Echo, Gremas, Kristeva, Revzin, Uspensky, Zegin, etc. Despite having these references in mind, he develops a certain wariness toward logocentrism and anything that might tend to reduce the work of art and the image in general to a purely communicative function or a simple illustration in the modern sense of the term. In another letter to, to Damisch, Shapiro refers to himself as an Augenmensch, a man of the eye, and argues for a semiotics beyond text-based iconography, a non-logocentric semiotics that would be able to go beyond the misleading dichotomy of form and content in order to grasp the problems of transformation, translation, and displacement that form the real substance of visual artworks. 
This established, let's move on to Shapiro's growing practice. What lessons can be drawn from these two essays for the analysis of his drawings and more particularly for his epistemic use of the graphic instrument? Let's observe this by looking at four fundamental functions of drawing for the study of visual arts, to perceive, to compare, to analyze, and to experiment. To draw an object in order to study it, whether it is to create a document for future analysis or to use the line to engage in a dialogue with the object, is an experience distinct from the one offered by a free visual observation. Drawing is a way of physically grasping the visible. The intervention of the body, the eye and the hand in the perception of the artwork through drawing appears in the specific practice of a recreation of the object. This can be observed in Shapiro's copy of Sera L'Enfant Blanc. When he reproduces Sera's work, Shapiro is looking for an experience, not so much the production of an image than the experience of the conditions of its production, and with that, of the sensations that this act might provide. In other words, the drawing encourages a realization of the ways by which the body experiences the object. To be understood, the drawing must be observed very closely. Shapiro reproduced the conditions of, of production of the drawing very precisely by adopting on one hand the same tools as the artist, Conte Pencil and Michelet paper, and on the other hand, by adjusting his framing to the weft of the paper so that the watermark is revealed at the exact same place that in Sora's drawing. I hope you can see that here, the watermark, and it's here, but less visible, but it's, it's exactly in the same place. This degree of accuracy gives Shapiro the possibility to feel like the artist, the gems of the Conte pencil lead when it glides over the grainy paper and encounters the obstacles of its surface but also to get a real visual equivalence between the model and the copy. This experience is not without consequences, as it is certainly this type of graphic experimentation that enables Shapiro to detect a connection between Seurat's graphic and pictorial techniques. Shapiro wrote in his 1958 essay on Seurat, I quote, the dots in Seurat's paintings have something of the quality of the black grains in his incomparable drawings in Conte Crayon, where the varying density of the grains determines the gradations of tone. In front of works of art or looking at visual reproductions, the practice of drawing also allows Shapiro to confront various forms of or iconographic representations, to oppose them or, on the contrary, to bring them together. This comparison process makes it possible to identify objects that are subject to analysis and to assign them a place in an art history sequence that is constituted or in the process of being set up. But this kind of comparison is not only for ta taxonomic purposes. It can also lead to interpretation. Let's take the example of Shapiro's study after Suzanne Les Joueurs de Cartes here. Thanks to this drawing, Shapiro compares Orsay painting with, with the one representing Paul Alexis Lisant de la Maison de Zola on the right. And this to highlight the similarity between the absorption of card players and that of artists, writers, poets, painters. In both cases, they escape the world and plan their actions. Shapiro writes about this specific relation between artistic practice and game in his 1952 essay on Cézanne. I quote, in selecting this intellectual phase of the game, a kind of collective solitaire, he created a model of his own activity as an artist. For Cézanne, painting was a process outside the historical stream of social life, a close personal action in which the artist, viewing nature as a world of variable colors and forms, selected from it in slow succession, after, deliber after deliberating the consequence of each choice for the whole, the elements of his pictures. 
Another essential function of drawing in the practice of artistry is to cut out for analysis the whole of the work in discrete units. There can be no description and understanding without distinction. By operating the passage from the whole to the parts, from the complex to the simple, the drawing decomposes, decomposes, deconstructs, abstracts, and makes visible what does not always let itself be grasped in the profuse of a totality. This is precisely where drawing is a tool. It allows one to extract from a set of details, a line, a chromatic effect, a contrast. It can subtract or emphasize, increase or decrease, vary the scales, make rapprochements, synthesize, essentialize, simplify, and thus participate at the rhythm of thought to the analysis process. And one of the main consequences of this process is the possibility to create a passage between the visible and the speakable, between the world of images and that of language. By representing in detail every formal characteristic of an object, for example, the pillars of Moissac here, Shapiro divides the work in discrete units, which allows him afterwards to turn the image into words. The fragmentation enables the shift from one state to another in that only the collection and concatenation of details can tell the whole story of the work. To take a more specific example, in order to analyze Kandinsky's Improvisation 28, Shapiro adds to the drawing words translating what eye and hand have noted. From the overall composition, he introduces through a system of arrows and comments here, that you see the arrow here, indications on the chromatic range, the tonal values, the effects created by the patterns of layered and intertwined lines, etc. We can read on the sheet of paper this thing, this sentence, three sets of drawn lines superposed on, on colored patches variable relation of pitches to a drawn line. This is the, the sentence here. Beside this fragmentation of the composition, drawing is also by Shapiro, is, is also used by Shapiro to identify the formal relationships established between the various sections of a painting, opposition, symmetry, repetition, variation. And in the case of Seurat, La Poudreuse here, the figurative elements in the composition are taken out of the group, then reduced to their structuring lines before being confronted to one another. Shapiro notes the resemblance between, on the one hand, the lines forming the arms, corset and chest of the young woman, and on the other hand, the curve and straight line of the vanity. Here, the bust, here, the vanity. And it shows with the drawing that all it takes is a 90 degree rotation of the table to get the same sinuosity than the young woman's bust here, the 90 degree rotation of the table. The schematization of the forms reduced to a few lines here on the right enables Shapiro to make a number of suggestions in margin of the drawings, I quote, the form of table is analog to corset and arms. Corset and table are complementary forms. Table versus corset, flat concave versus flat convex. Or also in regards to the formal echoes between the shapely hairdo and the chest, hair is an inversion of corset field. The examination of the graphic deconstruction to which Shapiro submits the painting revealed that Seurat plays a sort of construction game here. Thanks to, a, thanks to a process of inversion, left, right, top, bottom, or rotation and opposition, concave, convex, it produces from the same model a great number of forms. The result of this study in variation is to unify the composition, to create a set of internal visual connections, which gives the image stability. As Shapiro explained in his unpublished manuscript on Seurat, it is the entire formal complexity of the composition that reveals itself beyond the apparent simplicity of the image. I quote, 
what appears at first as an obvious, even artless juxtaposition of objects in the simplest placing side by side reveals to closer perception surprising contrast, variations, and accords. End quote. And in another passage of the same manuscript, we feel the kinship of forms, but we cannot easily discover how one has become the other. The other. It is these complex transformations that are the genuinely inventive aspect of Soha's use of repeats and that distinguish him from artists of lesser quality who in designing ornamentally weaken our interest in the forms. The most interesting invention of this kind is the relation of the table to the figure. The torso has much in common with the table." End quote. If drawing is first and foremost an operator of the formal analysis. It can also serve to reveal the impact of the form on the formation of meaning. It is, for example, what transpires from the studies devoted to, by Shapiro to another in Sora's paintings, Le Cirque. Here, Shapiro uses the drawing to follow the line that runs from the figure of the clown to that of the horse and includes the ringmaster, the acrobatic clowns, and the horsewoman here. This simple pencil drawn line extracts from the composition a wavy form that is not really perceptible when looking at the painting in its fictitious depth. But this form, once detected, appears as literally structuring and meaningful, as it seems to translate the rhythm, the curved, sinuous, and capricious movement, movements of the troupe characteristics of circus entertainment. I quote here again Shapiro's manuscript on Sura. If we trace the outlines of the clown, the rider and horse, and the other performers, we are carry, carried along in a strange capricious pass in which certain movements occur often enough to be felt at a rhythmical theme. It is a motif of the whole that can be discovered in unexpected parts of the scene. The figure of the circus is always in motion, and in a motion that deforms the body, assuming shapes that are grotesquely improbable and forced." End quote. Here, the formal foundation carries the deep meaning of the subject depicted. There is therefore conjunction, or better congruity, between the signified and the signifier by specific visual means. As we see, graphic representation can reconfigure and redeploy the object of study by subtracting it from its real conditions of visibility or by putting it in motion. And this graphic exploration is a real experimental, ex uh, experimental operation. In fact, this is precisely how Shapiro described this part of the investigation in his Sura manuscript. To introduce his commentary on La Poudreuse, he explained that it is by considering the forms through experimentation that crucial observations can occur. I quote uh, Shapiro, let us consider the shapes experimentally, exploring their relations to neighboring forms. We shall discover then the richness of analogies and distinctions which an all over schema will ignore. It is uh, in the same openly speculative perspective, and this will be my, my last example, uh, Shapiro used drawing to experiment and in return to offer a renewed visual experience of Manet's Olympia. Shapiro made a charcoal study after Olympia when he was in a drawing class at Columbia in 1923. The drawing is labeled Manet Olympia, but the inscription placed head down invites the viewer to turn the drawing and contemplate the work in the opposite direction. Some 20 years later, in a series of unpublished notes devoted to Manet's Olympia, Shapiro echoed this reversal by writing, I quote, new power of pure silhouetting, immediacy and candor. Look it upside down. Silhouette contains all important elements of painting, identification of the human with a kind of flat, whiteness. By suspending the process of mimetic recognition, the experimental reversal leads the viewer to distinguish the contrast between the colored masses 
and the effects of flatness. To sum up, these graphic experiments make it possible to show what is not visible, to test hypotheses, to project possibilities. And it is exactly in this sense that drawing is a cognitive process, an operation that can provide specific knowledge on visual art. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That's, that's really amazing to go through his drawings that way. And I really like your um, categorization you've adopted between what perceiving, uh, comparing, analyzing. Um, what was the last one? I'm forgetting the last category. Experiment. Experimenting. Um, I feel as though, um, especially in the first example, where you talk about perceiving, you talk about um, Shapiro's recreation of this Sirah Conti Cran drawing, where he adopts the same materials, aligns up the watermark, and really wants to, to recreate, re-experience this, this work of art very directly. You know, really wants to recreate this experience for himself, the experience of facture. Um, I think there you, you, you can start to get a sense, uh, at least I do, of, of what came up in the first uh, panel and some of the discussions where there's a certain kind of cult of experience I think happening in Shapiro. Um, I think it's very powerful though. I mean, on the one hand, we can be suspicious of it in some ways and that's a healthy skepticism to have. But at the same time, I think it really results in some pretty, power, pretty powerful observations about the Seurat drawing in particular. Um, this then in turn reminds me of um, some of my comments about global modernisms and some of the questions about language and relativity and cultural relativity. Um, and, and if we think about Shapiro's um, recreative praxis here in relation to creating works of art, think about applying it to you know, cultures that don't have a written record to accompany them. Think about the, the vast resources of art history that often don't come with you know, complex and sophisticated literatures to interpret them through. What we have, right, we have, these, we have this massive record um, of world art um, and this recreative process through drawing that Shapiro um, really was a kind of master at, I think in some ways shows a kind of means of accessing that in a way that art historians, I think today, um, maybe don't don't think of intuitively, partially because there's been there isn't as much training uh, among art historians in artistic practice. Um, but but I, and I do know that you have other examples in your book uh, of artists of art historians who are trained as artists, and so I wanted to ask you about that. Um, and then I also wanted to ask you about the history that you've learned about in terms of um, Shapiro's specific context of of art education. You know, you know he he did some various training as an artist in various contexts. Um, and in the American context, it can be related to things like the Fogg method at, at Harvard, where for a long time artist, art historians were trained as artists. Um, so those are some initial thoughts and questions, uh, just to repeat the, the other examples in your book of art historians who trained as artists, and then also some of the background of Shapiro's art education uh, would be super interesting to know. The first, the, yes, uh, the other example are uh, <laughs> numerous in a way. So just to... to to give some names, uh, it begins with uh, Burkhardt. Jakob Burkhardt was a really skilled in Trustman too. Uh, or the, the way, uh, um, the most important maybe example for me are Hubert Damisch, who drew not so well in a way, but the drawings he, he produced are very interesting for their uh, um, experimental and, and uh, their capacity to analyze uh, uh, works of art. There is also the very interesting example of uh, Leo Steinberg uh, drawing practice. And he was a very skilled draftsman. He teached also uh, drawing uh, in, in, in New York and in London before uh, uh, arriving in, in the United States. Uh, there is also Le Marin, um, Wolfling was also uh, a draft man and well all these, these uh, art historians who uh, for part of them uh, begin to, uh, to, to learn art and art history by practicing art themselves 
And in Germany, as you certainly know, uh, during 19th century, still right uh, and true during the, the, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, drug practice was part of the, of the courses uh, in, in the, the academic courses in, in university. Uh, I think it's quite the same in, in the United States uh, in the 20s and, and 30s, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, the all about uh, uh, drain class, uh, that, that, that the one you, you talked about? Yeah, there was a whole curriculum um, at Harvard from the already in the 1880s um, into the 1940s and 50s where this happened, where art historians were encouraged to learn practical artistic techniques. Um, it, it's an interesting question to ask why this stopped happening. Because now, I mean, it'd be interesting to poll people in the audience here among the art historians, how many of us have actually had a fine art education in some ways. Um, I mean, it, it hasn't gone away, but you know, it, I think it's much of a less um, notable quality of art historical scholarship these days. And it makes me wonder to what extent this also follows um, a more linguistically attuned form of art history. Um, I think that there, we can explain that um, by the, the way art history developed during the, the 20th century and the um, iconological approach which is more connected to uh, sources and less to formal uh, analysis, in a way. The way, uh, the way uh, Panofsky, uh, in a way, shaped it. Uh, I, may I say something? I think it's also to do with the long history of two slide projection that happens, I believe, before 1914, but was the way I was taught, although I was taught by an artist, John Golding, um, that idea of, of having to look at two things at once and distinguish the differences mm -hmm. didn't have time for one's personal involvement. That's right. Mm -hmm. There's also this, this uh, history of two slides and projection, which is a very important uh, device for uh, art history uh, since uh, Velflin, of course. Um, I think that there mm -hmm. is the, the um, the, at the very beginning of the 20th century, the, the idea that in France, at least in France, maybe also in, in America, uh, it was necessary to uh, make a, a, a distinction between artist, artistic practice, uh, arts and science, and artistry was in, in the... Um, was trying to 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 get as uh, academic uh, palms in a way and, and putting away or trying to to put aside the, the the artistic practice which is more connected to sensibility subjectivism etc. But it not it doesn't explain everything. Uh, yeah, no, that's a very good point. Yeah, there's a certain kind of aspirational attitude of art history trying to become more rigorous and. At a certain moment, maybe the language of art history is is an area where the rigor is is identified, as you noted, with iconography, uh, maybe being the most evident example and well known example of kind of this logocentrism. Um, now you know that there is a lot of of art historians who practice drawing now, now maybe because the iconic uh, term or is well. In, in, style based and it's easier to practice or to say well I'm also practicing drawing and I am think about the way uh, Dario Gamboni uh, used drawing for his own work and, and talk about this a little um, and David Rosen used drawing too uh, so this tradition is not completely uh, has not completely disappeared uh, it's still um, present, but um, needs to, to be uh, understand and, and, uh, and analyzed. Yeah. Um, uh, Maggie, please. Yeah, it struck me in your um, analysis section when you were talking about the Sarah uh, lady uh, powdering her nose. That you, that you showed those little um, very elementary uh, linear shapes 
and how they are kind of uh, combined and repeated and so on, which is a very linguistic model. <laughs> um, you know, like phonemes that have a different meaning in different contexts and so on. So that even while, you know, it's a very, you know, hands-on drawing kind of thing he's doing, he has this linguistic model in mind. Certainly, yes. There is this uh, sign of drawing, um, there is schematic, uh, like the one uh, people who work on, on linguistic uh, invent and produce. I think about Marin, Louis Marin used this kind of drawings too. Yeah. Uh, and yes, we, we, we can see a connection between the two. But the, the way he, he used the, this kind of drawing is always to return to visual uh, uh, visual conclusion or uh, a statement in a way, and this is, I think, the, the very interesting thing in uh, his, pra his drawing practice. Uh, even if it's always connected to words, words are numerous in the page. At some point, we can have an understanding of the, the operation just to look at the just looking at the at the drawings. But I don't I want I don't want to say that uh, linguistic and language is not necessary for for Chateau and for us, of course not. That's that's great, Jeremy. We have a few questions now. We have Hagi would like to say something. Um, then uh, Betsy Sears in the audience would like to ask a question, and then Sarah and then Karen, so that's um, four in a row, in that order, if, and then Megan. Uh, so, Hagi, oh, please first. Hey, thank you. Um, Jeremy, it was a wonderful talk and an exciting, really an exciting talk, and I think that one of the reasons it was so exciting was that you were able to kind of bring us in to the kind of practice of doing art history or doing looking in an art historical way through drawing. And you, you and, and the excitement has to do with the fact, I think that, and this is something that drawing brings about, or, is that the visible is never a given. It's never just something that is there as a factual, um, as a fact. So the visible opens itself up and it is, as, as Oli said before, it's resourceful in the sense that we are, our engagement with it allows us to see different levels in it and to unpack it and to, to allow depth of the visible to show themselves. Now, th this is basically, I relate that to a kind of a phenomenological <clears throat> understanding of the, of the visible, but I think that in his own very particular way, um, Shapiro shares this kind of um, method of, of seeing. So it's not just seeing in the sense of gathering information, but in the sense of opening up the visible. And um, in another way to, to think about it is through the, what in the history of philosophy is called the imagination, or even in the Kantian tradition, the productive imagination. It's imagination as kind of opening up the condition of having something appear as an image. So this is something that, that's striking and I really like the specificity of it. It's not kind of big ideas or maybe perhaps it is big ideas, but they're constantly embodied embodied ideas such as, and, and the looking itself, the drawing itself is also an embodied activity. So it's an, an, the doing art history, it's amazing in this sense, it's an embodied activity. So this is one part of my, my what I have to say. The other part is his kind of uh, response to Wittgenstein, which I find quite peculiar because I would think that Wittgenstein would completely agree with with what he's doing. So first he begins with this quote, which is not exactly a quote. And I'm not sure that Wittgenstein would say exactly something like that. I mean, 
the early Wittgenstein would say things about the limits of my language or the limits of my world. But again, in, in, when we talk about language, there's a whole question right about the relation between language and thought. And Wittgenstein, or at least the later Wittgenstein, doesn't think it's the same. Also, the earlier one doesn't think uh, that, lang that, that, you, that thought equals language. And the same goes for seeing or for perception. So I don't understand the position he ascribes to him. And then it's interesting that at the end, he says that Wittgenstein's mistake was not recognizing universals, which is kind of a slightly different problem, not the one he started with. So I, I was wondering whether you had thoughts about that as well. We'll begin by the second question, uh, the Wittgenstein problem, which is uh, something that I, I try to to understand better because it's as you said uh, there is a, a disconnection between the way he resolved the, the question by uh, s reflecting on, on drawing and and saying that you uh, the practice and and using uh, drawing is a, a solution to understand and an autonomous solution to, to understand the, the world, the objects, which is not completely connected to the, uh, the universal that he, he mentioned at, uh, in his letter to, to Damish. Um, I think I'm completely, uh, I agree with you. I think it, it's not really what Wittgenstein would uh, say about this. And, the way he transformed the quotation or the the, the statements uh, taken from uh, Malcolm uh, memoir and the way he introduced it in his uh, uh, paper in in the uh, on representing and knowing uh, uh, show that he. he do not really understand the, the Wittgenstein position on this this uh, topic. The way Wittgenstein think about the, the moving, the transformation of aspects, uh, and and well, well uh, you know that better than me. <laughs> but I, I agree with you. There is a misunderstanding here uh, regarding the first uh, the first observation and, and question. Uh, the phenomenological approach, Mayor Shapiro's phenomenological approach, which is never, uh, almost as far as I know, uh, directly or precisely um, connected to phenomenology. Husserl, maybe sometime, but uh, I don't. I don't find uh, uh, something in his writing about this, and obviously know nothing about uh, Merleau-Ponty, uh, uh, even if they, they knew each other, and there is a correspondence between the two, but not on philosophical uh, uh, problems. More, it's more, it's uh, connected to, to political and, and academics problems. Um, but it's really interesting because they are walking in the same direction for me. Uh, but, and Oliver know that Shapiro is coming from Dewey uh, uh, um, position and he was one of the, uh, Art as Experience was a very important book for, uh, for Shapiro during the, uh, the, the 30s. And also for, to, to understand the way he, he think about drawings and pra artistic practice for Art history. I think we can go uh, go through Arthur's experience. Uh, yes. So, is there a way to connect uh, Dewey and phenomenological, the French phenomenology, uh, for you? Is it possible, Oliver? <laughs> it is possible, and I think it's somewhere in yeah. between. And I, and I also think it's important to note that Shapiro was also very critical of Dewey at points. Sure. Don't, we don't want to collapse them. There's some amazing letters from the 40s where Shapiro just rips John Dewey apart. I mean, it is amazing. And this is when he's speaking to most of his friends who are more Marxist than even he is. Um, and they're very, very incisive comments, but 
that's another conversation. We have, we have a lot of questions, so I wanted to get to the questions. Um, Betsy Sears in the audience had a question. Um, Okay, I'm unmuted, you can hear me, yes? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Hi everyone, hi. <laughs> um, Jeremy, of course, that was fascinating and I think your project is so wonderful. And uh, you know, as people will know, you're putting together an exhibition and there's an exhibition catalog and through that, I was drawn into this drawing project, which is uh, by working with Panofsky's uh, hitherto unknown drawings. And one thing that interested me when I was working and I began to think uh, along the lines you are opening up was the way that uh, the individual in front of the work while traveling, and I'm just working out of Panofsky here, but I saw, of course, the same thing in your examples, was uh, undertaking a kind of complementary uh, uh, verbal visual uh, exercise, you know, that one can talk about the experience, uh, the knowledge gained from artistic experience through drawing, absolutely. But also, is there a, a, a knowledge from the discursive practice in front of the thing? Because you're, you're writing, you're translating, you're finding ways to express. And the, this is what I was going on to think about, kind of the practical necessity of creating argument out of the visual, which is a very, you know, particular thing to our field, uh, you, you know, to find the words to make the argument. And is uh, one really one, um, I once talked to a philosopher who said, what art is, uh, you, you, you argue by description, you, you take the viewer through, you make the viewer see what you see. And if the viewer agrees to see as you see, the argument is made. And uh, he, he found it kind of uh, shocking. And so what I was uh, wondering was about was that translation. Um, I come as a medievalist, you know, and we all grew up on Mossack Suyak Silos as these fantastic examples of visual description made into argument. And we have studied them. And I can say that, um, I just looked it up, I haven't thought about it for years, but a uh, long time ago and a kind of a basic thing I wrote on reading medieval images, I took Baxendall, we were talking about him earlier, which is uh, why, one reason I bring it up, and his language of art and uh, his various categories. I was just looking at it. It was, you know, comparative and metaphorical words, uh, causal or inferential words, subject or ego words. And um, what I did at that point was to take Shapiro's essays and thread them through Baxendall. It was really quite interesting. And I've got some of the kinds of things he says in the various categories, the flow of facial service, meandering edges, tense and vehement combination for one, a body otherwise soft and submissive for another, uh, for category two, energetically contrasted lines, intricate juggling of symmetrical schemes, for three, exciting zigzag, elegant contrast, seemingly confused or arbitrary space. You know, these are so vivid, so unusual, so uh, impressive to us uh, if we are analyzing descriptive language used in argument. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit of, in your thinking about drawing and drawing in relation to uh, the words that are with the drawings that uh, ultimately lead the thought process and lead to the final project, lead to the result, which is description of a picture next to it, you know, uh, how, how this transition, have you gone a little further in the process to the uh, descriptive argumentative result? Uh, you're totally right. It's a, a huge issue. Uh, drawings uh, and drawing practice as something can lead to uh, a good formulation of what we what we can uh, observe, see. Um, I know that I don't know the, the, the words, but Aga, you will help me. Tamar Meyer told me that uh, in Hebrew, uh, writing and Drawing is the same word, right? To write and to draw, <laughs> the same word. No, you don't have it. 
Well, yes, this so idea, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm thinking what word she had in mind. I don't, but, know, I don't know. Uh, we have to, have to think of, of, of ancient Greek, like the graphene, like photography. Uh, the of course. Uh, and this idea that making a drawing, you are in the, in the past, or uh, it's, it, it naturally leads to, to graphene, to, to uh, scripture, to, to writing. And what I, I see in Maya Shapur practice, and it's also really true uh, for uh, Hubert Damisch, the way they uh, divide the, um, the composition in discrete units that are um, the conditions to formulate the, the, the description, every details of the, of, the, of the composition, every part of the composition, and the way they are connected, intertwined, linked. Uh, so moving from uh, a vision, a referential vision or uh, perception of an image to uh, texture, to the, the way it's, it's, it, uh, it's uh, working. Uh, they describe the work also, the at work, the, the, the poetical uh, dimension of the work. Uh, and uh, drawing reproduce this also. Um, so it's, it's not uh, strange uh, at the end that uh, the, the most incredible uh, descriptions in art history, Shapiro's one, uh, Hubert Damisch one, who is also an incredible uh, uh, writer and he described works of art uh, incredibly, are the one who produced this kind of drawings. I think that there is a connection very uh, yep. important. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. That's a great point. I um... Make sense or sorry for my... No, yeah. no, that makes total sense. I mean, the example from your presentation that really st stuck in my mind was his drawing of Olympia, where he does this inversion. And then one of the words you read off the paper, I believe, was candor, mm -hmm. uh, immediacy and candor. And when I looked at the drawing and then and you, you saw how he did the inversion, it seems to me the drawing, when reduced to this black and white inverted image, very much does convey this sense, at least to me, of candor. Mm -hmm. So it felt to me like the drawing was a way for him, as you've been saying, to kind of draw out certain qualities of the image that otherwise might be difficult to see, difficult to perceive. Um, but I wanna make sure we get to some other questions here. We're actually already running past four. So if people could just try to be brief. Um, that's first Sarah, then Karen, then Megan. So Sarah, please. Yeah, um, thanks Jeremy for a wonderful um, presentation. And I wanted to, uh, to add Ruskin potentially to the list, but my question is about empathic projection which is a term we use a lot in performance studies, for example, because when you think of him doing the first drawing with the Sera, he is indeed trying to be Sera, and you show that very beautifully. When he's dissecting the, um, the La Poudreuse, and I hope we're going to lend you to your show this Poudreuse, which we have, and we also have the sketch of the Cirque. What I wanted to say was, it's not only analyzing in its clever way, but of course it's slowing down looking because normally as art historians and as trained art historians, we look at things extremely quickly. And one of the things it's doing is taking a long, long, long time to look, which is slowing down that immediate notion of empathic projection. And on the contrary, when he turns the thing upside down, it's like deliberate estrangement as a technique to see differently. So I, I think that even when one, in a normal way, not when one's going to write a paper, looks at a Van Gogh or looks at the Heidegger, you know, looks at the shoes, you empathically project before you retrain yourself and do your analysis, your comparison, your whatever. So I just thought that that notion and the notion of speed as well as, um, as, no, as notation and analysis is interesting here. And speed and also then estrangement, sort of playing with oneself, playing with one's projection and then um, alienating oneself from that too easy form of, of, um, of projection. Thank you very much for this remarks. I will, I will try to 
to take your, your observation, the, the idea of speed, which is a very interesting one, and speed and the opposite also, the, uh, the long time running and the, this, uh, the way you slow down the, 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 the relation to the, to the work of art. And this is something that we lost you know, and now with our iPhones. And, and even if we are art historians and we want to, we think that we want to, to analyze something, we go fast. Uh, and it's, it produced a, a totally different uh, observation, I think. So, um, and the idea of estrangement uh, that it can uh, look for by uh, making this drawing uh, on Manet is a really interesting notion too. Uh, uh, can we connect it to the the, the ground of, of the estrangement from the Bertolt Brecht uh, theater, do you think? Or can we... Well, it's certainly making the figurative abstract for starters, mm. which brings up a whole other ball game. And I'm very interested in an anti-Kraussian definition of the informel, which goes back to Degas looking at piles mm. of coal and things. And of course, through the Conte crayon and everything, he's making a massive great oil painting turn into an abstraction that is very much going towards the informel and the inform as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, you know, that leads into that whole ball game as well. Thank you, yeah. I would just note here, Sarah, that your comments and Hagi's comments will very much resonate with each other. Hagi's comments initially about vision not being a given, right? The visual fact is not given. It needs in some ways to be produced by us. And you can actually see in a quite rewarding way, Shapiro producing these observations of his through his drawings. Um, there, there is a, real, um, a sentence by uh, Paul Valéry who's talking about looking at something uh, with your eye and looking uh, at something with a pen in the hand or a, job, a pencil. It's totally different. You, you you don't see the same thing. So I think. So it, he's the one who wrote Degas dessin, which yeah. is really the beginning of the informel as theory, and not what our great American um, formalists say. So uh, we should we have move on to the next? Uh, Karen, you had a question. You were next. Yeah, I do have a question, but let's hear from Megan because we haven't heard from her yet, and we're short on time. Please, Megan. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Um, can everyone hear okay? I've been having a buzzing, so I'm not sure. I hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, that was really stimulating. My questions came in one um, sort of drawing on Sarah's comment and also an earlier comment about the graphism. I was struck by that, um, the breaking down of the Sarah image um, to, brought to my mind um, the, the basic how to draw books where you take one like bit and it grows and grows and grows and, and that kind of that genre came to mind. So that was just a comment. Um, my question was very along the same lines as Betsy's, um, but a little bit more technical. Um, I just wondered if we actually know where these drawings sat actually physically as he was composing and writing. I don't know a lot about his method of writing. Um, and I wondered where the drawings sat and in particular where they sat alongside other forms of reproduction. So as he's writing and, and working out pieces, were these beside him, were they underhand, were they his primary reference? And, and because again, when Betsy was bringing some of these quotations that are so fami familiar to me also as a medievalist, they struck me as being just as descriptive as a, a, a flat line drawing as they are of the Suyak sculptures, no matter how graphic they may be um, in their composition. And then slightly beside that, and I don't want to go on much longer, but the relationship between the kinds of drawings he produced when working through and analyzing um, uh, two-dimensional media 
and like painted and, and drawings versus the kinds of drawings he produced when confronting architectural, sculptural um, objects. I wondered if you saw a, a great difference in the ways he um, works through those, through his drawings. Sorry, that was kind of a lot. Yeah. Uh, regarding the, the way the drawings are, are uh, displayed in his archive, and this is something really connected to the way he used it during his life because the, the archive was uh, uh, thought as uh, together with his wife before the, the, the transmission to Cologne University. So uh, it's in a way a, a photographic uh, uh, aspect of the, the of Shapiro's archive. And here in the archive you have a lot of drawings in little boxes, drawing like this, very small, uh, like a, a postcard, you know, the size, uh, in boxes, and drawings uh, are sometimes uh, put uh, together, and then uh, there is a, a paper with only uh, something writing. Uh, it, there is no rules in a way, but there is a lot, a lot of drawings in this little box. And writings or um, notes and drawings are always uh, uh, intertwined. They are always working together. The drawings I show you uh, about on uh, Seurat's La Poudreuse, th those are specific. Some are in little boxes, but some are directly in produced in the manuscripts. And the one I show you with uh, very simplistic graphic uh, notations are in the manuscript. So they work really together. Uh, and and uh, the way the experiments, the, the, the experience produce the, uh, the conclusion and the description is uh, clearly uh, visible here. Uh, regarding the, la the last question, um, uh, in a few words, just <laughs> tell me again, what, 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 what was your last question? Oh, about, uh, just if you saw uh, Architecture uh, and, and, and painting. Yes, there is a, a difference between drawings made for, uh, to study architecture and painting. Uh, there is one stage more, in a way, for architecture. You always try to have uh, uh, a vision of the, uh, the buildings in this entire uh, dimension, the map for is mapping the, the, the building too. Uh, but it's quite the same um, process, uh, trying to multiply the, the angle of vision, the, the point of view, and to have a lot of uh, information. The drawings produced during the, the 27 uh, and 28 uh, um, journey in Middle East and France were to, to store or to produce the image that you will uh, have with him back in the US and using as, uh, as sources to, to, to work on because photography are something and drawings are, uh, provide other information. So, Oh, yeah. Chapeau is really uh, a world of this, this inquiry. It's incredible. That's why I, I'm, I think there is a book here to, to, to me. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I, I was too long. Sorry, Oliver. No, no, that's OK. Uh, we, are, we are well over time, but I think it's OK. Um, Hagi, I just wanted to check with you. Do you have, do you have to leave immediately at 5? Because if we, you do, then we should probably move on and unfortunately not answer the rest of the questions. Maybe maybe we should then. Oh. Do, do we want a kind of three minutes break before we do that or? I, I think we should, yeah. I think maybe we should do a three to five minute break. Uh, and I'm sorry to people who didn't get to answer their questions. Maybe we can bring them up in the discussion um, after Hagi's paper, but um, just make sure we, we keep to the time frame at least moderately. Um, so we'll see everyone in about well, five minutes or so. So let me begin. 
Um, the two texts that, that I um, chosen were the one on Cezanne and the among the philosophers, and the famous text on 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 Heidegger. And let me concentrate on that. And if you'd like to bring up the other text in the in the discussion, that would be great. So so I'll I'll just begin. Um, what is it that remains today of Shapiro's famous 1968 note on Heidegger and Van Gogh? What is the true, what is the value of returning, of rereading Shapiro's critical confrontational response to Heidegger, of rethinking the so called Shapiro Heidegger debate today in 2021? <clears throat> In the years since its publication, the Shapiro-Heidegger debate has become a common point of reference for theory, largely because of the influential introjection of, of Jacques Derrida. And I would even say that the whole idea of a debate is a construction by Jacques Derrida. In fact, there was no debate. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. No real debate. And um, so I think it is to him that we owe the idea of a debate. But in spite of its uh, wide renown, the episode between Shapiro and Heidegger, the Shapiro text, uh, was never really taken to be more than a mere anecdote, one that has not contributed much to the future thinking on art or on painting or on the relationship between art history and philosophy. Moreover, for people doing theory, Shapiro's response to Heidegger continues to resonate as a moment of failure. So if you take someone like W.J.T. Mitchell, for example, he writes that the notorious note on Heidegger and Van Gogh is one of the most depressing episodes in art history's continued failure to engage with theory and philosophy in the 20th century. For him, I quote again, it is the clearest moment of Shapiro's resistance to theory. Now, is this really so? Is Shapiro refusing to engage philosophy? Or is his response to Heidegger precisely a form of response to philosophy, to a certain theoretical way of uh, approaching art? So the question of returning or of how to return to this episode is not a simple one. It's not that a debate is just there for us, waiting for us, and all we have to do is to jump in and take sides. Again, apropos we talked about, apropos the things we talked about, the visual in, or the visible in Jer Jeremy's talk, here too the debate is not a given or the a text like Shapiro's response is not a given. It's something that has that is in time and changes its meaning through time. So the debate is not just there open for us. Of course, this is something one is tempted to do. We often like to kind of put ourselves in debates and choose a side. But I think that, and I'll try to show that more, that things get more interesting when we hold back and look at the dynamics of that so-called debate and in particular Chapio's role in it. Am I interested in rehabilitating Shapiro's position? Yes, but in a somewhat particular way, or yes, but I wish to do so as part of a larger move, a move which I'd like to, to sketch for you uh, now. But before I do so, let me, um, let me kind of put on the table a few kind of basic pointers. Um, most people know the, the basic details of the debate, but let me, let me summarize them. So Shapiro publishes his text, The Still Life as a Personal Object, and note on Heidegger and Van Gogh in 1968. He publishes it as part of a book in memory of his friend, the neurologist and psychiatrist Kurt Goldstein, who died in 65. And in the book or his piece, his note on Heidegger and Van Gogh is indeed a critical note, a very critical uh, response to Heidegger's treatment of Van Gogh's painting of 1886. The painting depicts a pair of shoes, um, one that in Heidegger's origin of the work of art becomes a very central example. 
The painting functions as a key example in the Ursprung des Kunstwerks. By the way, the, 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 the work itself, the work on the origin of the work of art, Heidegger's work dates back to 30, 1935, 1936. It's lectures he, um, gave after he resigned from uh, the rector, the position of a rector at Freiburg University. And which means that it goes also well with a certain change in his political affiliations. And yet, despite that, you can find quite a few places in this, in this text that remain rooted in a language that uh, complied with the demands of a totalitarian regime. So the publication of the text happened only after the war. I can talk about that if you'd like. So in the origin of the work of art, Heidegger uses the Van Gogh painting of peasant shoes in order to evoke a vision of the artwork, which he articulates in terms of the event of truth that the work of art opens up at the very tension between what he terms earth and world, two key concepts. The image of peasant shoes enables Heidegger to elaborate his understanding of the relationship between the, between the silent grounding and uncontainable materiality of the earth and the historical and social dimensions of a human life that relies on equipment and the practical logic of use. Furthermore, the empty shoes image enables him to explain how artworks can create a reorientation, a transformation of our situatedness in the world of equipment, whose essence typically remains hidden for us. For Heidegger, the, un, the artwork uncovers the instrumental essence of equipment, thereby revealing both the limitation of instrumental reason and the forgotten repressed potential of the earth. So in this context, you can see why the Van Gogh painting, it's so important for him that it belongs to, the, to a peasant woman, it belongs to the earth, but also is used in a kind of agricultural setting. So you have all the elements he needs. Um, if you want a short quotation from Heidegger, I hope that, that won't blow up the screen. Uh, I'll read it to you. The equipmental being of equipment was discovered, but how? Not through a description and explanation of a pair of shoes actually present, not through a report or the process of shoemaking, and not through the observation of the actual use of shoes. Rather, the equipmental being of equipment was only discovered by bringing ourselves before the Van Gogh painting. It is in this that it is this that spoke. In proximity to the work, we were suddenly somewhere other than we are usually accustomed to be. The artwork let us know what shoes are in truth. Van Gogh's painting is the disclosure of what the equipment, the pair of peasant shoes in truth is. This being steps forward into the unconcealment of its being, and you have a lot of Heidegger and jargon here. The unconcealment of being is what the Greeks called aletheia. Aletheia is the Greek word for, for truth, which has the a, uh, the negation, the beginning, and Heidegger develops the idea of that truth is always untruth, concealment and, and unconcealment always go together for him. I won't go into this right now. Now, as you know, Shapiro is not uh, too enthusiastic about uh, Heidegger, and in response, he seems completely uninterested in this metaphysical vision, which we can discuss if you'd like. For him, the Heideggerian pathos of truth is alarming, as it blatantly goes hand in hand with what he understands as a disregard for the facts. What facts? The fact of painting, and first of all, the fact of what is actually depicted in the Van Gogh painting. So he writes, while Professor Heidegger is aware that Van Gogh painted such shoes several times, he does not identify the picture he has in mind as if the different versions are interchangeable. So Shapiro writes Heidegger, he tells us, and asks him what to identify the picture, the painting. And he reports back, Professor Heidegger has kindly written to me that the picture in which he, to which he referred is one that he saw in a show in Amsterdam in March, 1930. By the way, Kurt Goldstein, his friend to whom he dedicates the, the piece and the one who introduced the piece to him uh, when he escaped Nazi Germany went through Amsterdam as well. Um, so this information enables the um, Shapiro to pinpoint the painting and he goes to the catalog and he says, this is clearly the Lafay's 
um, number 255, and he dates the painting as, and he can say with a, a high degree of certainty, he brings convincing evidence that these are not peasant shoes, but as I, I quote, they are the shoes of the artist by that time, a man of the town and the city. So since we are, um, we want to see some visuality, let me see if I can put the, share a screen with you. Hope this works. Is that fine? Oliver, can you? Yes, it looks good, Aggie. Okay. So these are the famous shoes. They are now at the 18, 1886 shoes. They are now at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And what Shapiro is saying, basic look, basically is, look, you, Heidegger, you kind of are disregarding the fact that, that Van Gogh drew, uh, painted shoes many times, 10, 11 times at least, and you're not, identifying them. So please give us a specific reference. And Heidegger does. And um, uh, Shapiro goes on to establish why these are Van Gogh's own shoes. I find it very convincing. Letters he wrote about the shoes, things from Gauguin describing his practice with the shoes, uh, his relation to the shoes, etc. And another, um, another kind of small detail one may be interested in is that when, when Van Gogh um, paints peasants during his whole career, uh, they don't wear, you, I've, they usually don't wear leather shoes, they, they wear uh, wooden clogs, as you can see. Okay. Okay, so 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 that's that's the basic um, that's the basic uh, claim, and um, in this sense, according to Shapiro, Heidegger conjures up an image of painted shoes that is an empty signifier, one that has no distinct reference in the historical factual world. To put this in a Trump era parlance, Shapiro is aversive to alternative facts. Alas for him, Shapiro writes, the philosopher has indeed deceived himself. He has retained from the encounter with Van Gogh's canvas a moving set of associations with peasants and soil, which are not sustained by the picture itself. They are grounded rather in his social outlook. Of course, the, you can hear here the, the reference to the uh, uh, Bluetooth Boden reference, kind of hidden. And um, he, in, in this sense, uh, he has his first claim against, against Heidegger. He doesn't, um, he doesn't address directly Heidegger's involvement with the Nazi party, but on, only invokes it a different a kind of in, indirectly. And we know that Shapiro was very much uh, involved in both helping refugees and in thinking about the the Holocaust and its significance. He had this uh, debate with Hannah Arendt. And uh, so that was a matter of great concern to him. And um, as I said, the, the, the critique was, was published in a, in a book uh, dedicated to, in memory of Kurt Goldstein, who escaped Nazi Germany. He escaped in 33, 34, he went to Amsterdam, and then in 35 arrived in New York and Shapiro tried to help him get a job, not so successful, et cetera, et cetera. In any case, I want to continue forward. In 1976, the year of Heidegger's death, Derrida publishes his famous restitutions. And it is in this text that, that the Shapiro-Heidegger uh, opposition uh, became articulated as a debate. In a way, Shapiro just wrote Heidegger to ask for the reference. Heidegger responded in a letter and gave him the reference and also was quite flattering. He said he admires him as an art historian and kind of hope they continue the conversation, etc. And but the, so there was no real debate beyond that. But for the for the Rida, it's important to put them together. And I'm very interested in this idea of 
the event of thought or the, what, what dialogue is or what a debate is. Where does it take place in 35, in 68, in 76, when Derrida puts them together later on? And I think that the whole, the interesting thing is to see this kind of dialectical process or this, or to see time and temporality as an axis that belongs to thought and is not just a container where we can put kind of thoughts or events of thought one after the other chronologically. So uh, uh, Derrida acknowledges uh, in his text that Shapiro is probably right about the facts of Van Gogh's painting and that Heidegger has mid had misidentified the painting choose, yet he sees this factual error as insignificant in comparison to Shapiro's complete misunderstanding of Heidegger's philosophical vision. Now, as someone who worked a lot on Heidegger, I can say, yes, Shapiro doesn't, I don't know if he doesn't understand, he doesn't understand Heidegger, but more than that, he doesn't make any effort to understand him. And I don't know if it, how it relates to what we read uh, with Jeremy about Wittgenstein, but kind of quotes pieces, but doesn't try to make sense of what the whole philosophical paradigm is, whether you agree with it or not. So he doesn't really go into the detail or into the depth of what Heidegger is trying to say. And he dismisses him as if he it was a kind of a scientific um, paradigm, apropos things we mentioned, conjectures and refutations. You have a scientific theory, and then you have a an example that can refute the theory, and that's enough. So for, for Shapiro, it seems at least that he has this example. The example is, is empty. The whole theory collapses. Now, of course, uh, uh, this is, things are more complicated than that, and Derrida is someone who, who, who mocks Shapiro for that. In fact, he in a way is very critical of, of both Shapiro and Heidegger. And he's critical of them. And that's the reason also he kind of holds them together as a pair, a pair Shapiro and Heidegger as a pair analogous to the pair of shoes because he sees in, in their insistence on this pair, um, a certain affirmation of a modernist uh, conception of meaning, of subjectivity, of world, that, uh, that at, at the basis of which you find the human subject, that human subject which stands on two feet and wears two shoes, which are a pair, that is a self-same entity that has no plurality, no alterity is part of it, positing itself two feet on the ground, erect, usually phallocentric, etc., etc. although in Heidegger it was a, a peasant woman. So, the con this is the conception that, that uh, Derrida wants to, to challenge. And in this sense, he sees both Shapiro and Heidegger as partners of the same, of, as sharing the same modernist uh, outlook. And uh, yet, despite his general critique, and by the way, Derrida suggests, let's not look at them as two shoes belonging to, as a pair, maybe they're two left shoes or something like that. So while, while this is Derrida's position, the line of argument that has proven most influential in his text, and one that continues to echo into the new millennium, is one that problematizes Shapiro's alleged dogmatism and theoretical naivete. So unlike Heidegger's conception of truth as aletea, which Derrida ultimately feels indebted to, Shapiro's traditional philosophical conception of truth as correspondence loses here its impact. Now, the consequent popularity of the Deridian project and its exposure of the debate to the evolving audience of post-structuralist thought came with a price. And I'm interested in how this debate or how Shapiro came into the kind of grinding machine of the postmodern mind. And things didn't go well for him there. Whereas Heidegger's philosophy never ceases to serve as a source of inspiration, uh, Shapiro is never is stigmatized as a historical positivist whose thinking cannot illuminate the power of art. In this spirit, the reception of Derrida's glib restitution construes Shapiro as an epitome of a modernist stance of an art historian that postmodern theory needs to overturn. Consequent reactions to his critique of Heidegger are typically critical and divisive and at times blatantly ignore this point. 
So just to give you an example, a case in point is Frederick Jameson's in influential postmodernism or the, or the cultural logic of late capitalism, which opens with a discussion of the Van Gogh example of shoes. Jameson, who is explicitly influenced by Derrida's restitution, ignores Shapiro completely and speaks of Van Gogh by embracing the Heideggerian Par Bauernschuhe as if the identification of the shoes was never challenged. In his description of the object world of agriculture and misery and the whole rudimentary human world of the where the peasant toil, etc., that appear in the painting, there is complete erasure, erasure of Shapiro's outcry and the question of what actually is seen or can be seen in a painting. But why has Jameson erased Shapiro from the records? Can this be connected to the installation of a new memory drive for the postmodern? One aspect of this erasure is connected to new developments in the study of the humanities in these years, something that leading eventually to the pictorial turn, the interest in images as not necessarily connected to a medium. So the emergence of visual studies and the new role of the image as an entity that invites theoretical investigation. Unlike a painting, an image is not singular in any material sense. And despite its essential reproducibility, it remains unchanged. The image of a pair of shoes of, by Van Gogh is something that can be seen in different mediums, different forms of reproduction, different screen sizes, etc. So if for Shapiro in 1968, painting was still the paradigm of what art is, and I'm thinking of, of, of Jeremy's talk again of painting is the paradigm for thinking about art, but if in 68 this was clear to Shapiro, although the grounds have been shifting already. In the 1990s, when, when um, Jameson writes his piece, this is no longer the case. And painting no longer, uh, is no longer understood as that which constitutes the, the ultimate paradigm for our art. And in this sense, I think that while Jameson is, is critical of, of the culture logic of late capitalism, he falls into the same trap. He kind of criticizes a culture of images, but he himself basically very deeply accepts the image as something which is um, not necessarily connected or not embodied in, in a medium. Now for Shapiro, it's important and he stresses it in many times that a painting is not a, an image. A painting is an object that you hold, it's material, it's often personal. And so this is something that I, I wanted to bring out. And again, WJT Mitchell, of course, uh, who's, um, a, who is a leading force in the creation of the visual turn in the humanities, we can understand why his position is similar. But now I want to return to, to Shapiro and uh, to return to Shapiro and ask whether there's really no lesson to be gleaned from his intervention. I can tell you that in the past, I, about 15 years ago, I wrote about Heidegger and Shapiro. And then I thought that I, I was quite instrumental myself. And I thought of Shapiro as someone who is a positivist. Today, I no longer think this way, but I thought that he is a positivist who nevertheless can teach us an important lesson about Heidegger's philosophy. And what he can teach us about Heidegger's philosophy is not that he kind of exposes the vulnerability of Heidegger's philosophy, not at all. What he exposes, I found, is that he exposes the ultra strength, the kind of thinking that is immune to its own examples that is part of Heideggerian philosophy. And in this sense, he kind of exposes a big problem in, in Heidegger, in my, my, my view. But, Today, I want to take it a step further. And I want to ask, I mean, what I just described is still to think of Shapiro within the parameters of this constructed debate. But is there a way to take Shapiro out of this debate? What would it mean to read Shapiro on Van Gogh independently of Heidegger? Can we read him as, a, as an active rather than a reactive uh, thinker? 
And the first direction, the first step in this direction would be to recall that Shapiro had been engaged in studying and writing on Van Gogh's work since the late 30s, beginning of the 40s. And his monumental essay on a painting of Van Gogh is dedicated, is kind of a, a, a clear monumental or starting point to look. And in this article, he addresses the gesture, the work of this painting produced at the end of Van Gogh's life, just before his suicide, where he writes that the singularity of Van Gogh's life lies in the fact that art was for him a personal destiny in the fullest sense. And here's where a notion that kind of continues to be important for Shapiro uh, needs to be articulated. And this is the idea of the personal object or the personal dimension of art. And I, and I can only um, read, to, I'll, I'll try to do it shortly. So let me read to you from the piece on, on, on Heidegger. He says, after he explains Heidegger's mistake, he says, Heidegger would still have missed an important aspect of the painting after the specific mistake. What he missed is the artist's presence in the work. In his account of the picture, he has overlooked the personal and physiognomic in the shoes that made him so persistent and absorbing a subject for the artist. And here, if we had more time, I would elaborate his conception of the personal, which is very uh, clear in the, in, the, in the, or developed very nicely in the parallel article on uh, Cezanne's uh, apples. And, um, I, I, will, I think I won't go into this, maybe just say that, uh, maybe just say the following, that when he deals with the apples, of course he's interested in, in the apples, but he, he is interested in a, also in a um, parallel agenda, which is to explore a dimension or a condition of painting that neither formalism nor iconography can articulate. And this condition has to do with the artist's pres personal presence in the artwork, a spectral presence that can be reduced neither to symbolism nor to psychoanalytic content, and that in Shapiro's view had explicitly called for recognition with the growth of still life painting in the 19th century. So in this sense, I want to say that we should understand the note on Van Gogh and, and Heidegger as indeed a note. That is, Shapiro sees himself as developing a whole conception of what the personal means in painting, of he develops this intimate relation to Van Gogh, who becomes his, I don't know if dear patient or close intimate uh, associate. Uh, he analyzes his, his paintings very closely, all the things that Heidegger, of course, doesn't do. And in this sense, when he hears or when he reads Heidegger, it's not that he just needs to respond. He responds from within a world that is very, that is multi-layered, that is deep in its intuitions. And um, he responds in to what he understands as a lack of respect to what he sees in the painting. That is this personal dimension. And um, if you want to take the, the notion of respect in a Kantian sense, for example, which is respect that is an openness to the thing in itself. You, it, the, the thing is not an instrument, but it's there in itself and you're able to embrace it. Then in, in, then in this sense, uh, Shapiro could be, could be um, said to be aggressive towards Heidegger's lack of respect. Now, one, uh, I, I have, I'll, I'll try to finish in a couple of minutes. Um, in this sense, I think there's an inter a very close and intimate relationship between Shapiro's relation to Van Gogh and his relation to um, Goldstein. And, Goldstein was a dear person for, for, a, for Shapiro. And one of the words that uh, I found um, 
that Shapiro uses both to describe um, Goldstein and to describe uh, Van Gogh was the word infirmity. And this word kind of touched me in, in, in a deep sense because it kind of this conjunction of the in and the firmity, something that was firm is now broken. The idea that a personality can be broken is something that I think um, Shapiro was very uh, sensitive to. And a question uh, was brought up, I don't remember by who, in, in our discussion today, how did the war affect his, his position? I think that this is part of the war, the big developments of the 20th century. He saw a new kind of identity that is, that is broken. It's not just death, but it's a certain kind of mutilation of identity that really bothered him. And uh, this is something he responds to. And I'd, I'd like to show you here, um, um, uh, I'd like to show you, oh boy, sorry. Um, these are all personal objects for Shapiro. He describes, he analyzes them, and he explains why, in what sense Van Gogh touches these objects, the, the, uh, the Bible and Le Joie de Vivre, et cetera. This is Goldstein. And I wanted to bring to you here uh, something from the, from the archive, which is a, a New Year card from Goldstein and his wife to uh, Shapiro in this very uh, vulnerable uh, handwriting. It says, uh, seasons, greetings, and a happy, healthy 1950 with thanks for all the stimulating hours in the year gone by. And it's, it's signed by Eva Rotman Goldstein and Kurt Goldstein. Again, a certain um, personal object, very vulnerable. Uh, Probably, um, I, f I forget the word for for this beautiful flower. Oliver, can you, maybe someone can help me with the name of the flower. It's something with a- A cyclamen. Cyclamen, right. A cyclamen. Um, so vulnerability is part of this very tender and, and tenderness as well, part of this flower. And I think this is the kind of thing that touch uh, Shapiro. Now, all this very interestingly is gone from uh, contemporary art history and art theory. Now, we need to remember that 1968, of course, it's gone. You think of the death of the author Roland Barthes and, of course, Derrida. And there's an erase, erasure of, of this dimension, which has good reasons. I mean, we can see why this need for the body, for the origin, for the self that is there and its vulnerability, holding on the world of meaning is needed and why one would want to criticize it. But I want to say that with this criticism, something very uh, precious uh, is also lost. And the way I would like to return to Shapiro is precisely uh, by, by understanding, um, wait a second, I'm, am I sharing screen now? No, no, sorry. Uh, so the way I want to return to Shapiro is by understanding that there is a loss here. And the question is, what does it mean for us today to think of the story of art, the story of art history, the story of philosophy, by on the one hand accepting loss as part of change, as part of uh, what allows us to, to get to where we are today, and yet at the same time make room for uh, recognition, for memory, for the importance of those dimensions. And to conclude, let me just say that I return here to Derrida's notion of restitutions. 
Now, Derrida used the notion of restitutions in a very, I would say, limited way. Um, and he, in, in a sense, um, wait, let me get, let me, I don't know how to get out of this. I'm sorry, am I, is my, um, am I share screening now? Screen sharing now or no? No, you're not sharing your screen, I'm it's not. just you. It's just me, so I kind of caught myself into some, sorry. Um, something, sorry, sorry, sorry. So I, so to conclude, I, 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 I'm saying that the Derrida's restitution is pronounced in a very narrow way. And Derrida understands uh, restitution as this kind, as, as what is primarily tied to this traditional conception of justice as restoration, where one returns typically property to an individual that lost injustice, unjustly lost the property. And the underlying assumption of this conception is that injustice disrupts an advantageous state of affairs that can in principle be restored and that this restoration will allow for a return, a reassertion of that past equilibrium. Now, Derrida is contemptuous of that, and he relates restitution or he ascribes restitutions to Shapiro. Shapiro for him is someone who does art history by manner of restitution, trying to see what, who the, the shoes really belong to. Now here, it's interesting that the same term in legal discourse um, took on new phases and new meanings uh, later on in the second wave of, of, of restitution claims. And in the 99, whereas the, the, the first wave of restitution had to do with uh, property that, that was supposed to be returned to their or, origin countries, countries of origin, in the 1990s, there's a second wave of international restitution efforts that uh, mar is marked by the declaration of the Washington principles on Nazi confiscated art. And this restitution paradigm sets as its aim to deal with the claim of individual v Jewish victims, which at the same, and at the same time to put forward an ethical code for museums, as you know, obliging them to research the provenance of their collections, etc. Now the emergence of this new paradigm of restitution is based on the understanding that most survivors of the Holocaust are no longer alive to give in, be given back what was unjustly taken away from them. So as such, the underlying assumption of a restitution claim today is the impossibility of a real return to the conditions of the past. A restitution claim is thus a claim for the restitution of memory, a claim for recognition of the intimate, Shapiro would call it the personal connection, between object and person beyond the obvious capitalist implication. And I would like to end with a question, what, whether this, I believe that this paradigm can teach us, and my question is what can it teach us about the debate? And in this sense, how can the debate allow art history and philosophy can engage, to engage and be part of a new hermeneutic of restitution? So here I end. Sorry if I was too long. Thank you so much, Agi. That was great. Um, also, very nice to have a, a a conversation. I mean, your presentation was really felt like a kind of a, a conversation, um, which I think felt like it, it matched very well with much of what you were what you were saying. Um, Part of what I take away in some ways from what you've said is um, that there is a kind of quite, quite deeply uh, seated um, ethics um, to, to this, what some might say is a kind of traditional art historical project um, of, um, of engaging with the work of art on a personal level that is between the art historian and the artist. Um, there is this work of art and, and recuperating, to use another word, of the artist's intentions in some ways is this really fundamental, fundamentally ethical act um, and to develop a, a grand philosophy outside of that that in some ways disrupts that poses some really fundamental questions. Um, 
uh, to me, um, in some ways, it, it reminds me well of a lot of things. Um, and maybe I've already spoken a lot, so maybe I'll turn it over to other people. Um, I see Johannes has his hand raised, raised um, Chloe, Margaret, or Maggie, and then Karen. Um, uh, maybe I'll give Karen and then Chloe the first go because they had their hands up last time. And then we'll go to um, Johannes and then, um, yeah. So it'll be Karen, Chloe, um, Johannes, then Maggie. So Karen, please. Oh, okay, well, I'll try to be, I'll try to be quick. Thank you, Hardy. That was uh, moving, but also uh, very, a lot, a lot to think about there. But I just, a quick response um, in terms of Derrida's response to Shapiro um, that may have taken a too strong view of, of his writing and of his idea of the artist as as a subject, as, as a non-changing kind of subject, because in this article, the first one, um, the first note on Van Gogh's paintings, he, he does mention that, um, that this was a personal object. The shoes were set there, he painted them, he responded to them, he saw them, but then he also saw the painting. And in doing that, in seeing the painting, it might've shown him aspects of himself that he might not have been so aware of. And this goes back to, to Jeremy's talk also about drawing, revealing um, aspects of the visible world, but also aspects of the self. And then he mentions that when Van Gogh painted the self-portrait with the bandaged ear, that perhaps part of the pathos of that image arises from the fact that he saw aspects of his injured self in those paintings of the shoes. So I think that he's, in other words, Shapiro has a sense of how the artist, the world can be revealed to the artist, but the also the artist is a subject in time. So um, that's just a point, a comment. Yes, I, I completely agree. Um, I I think that if, if you kind of read different, different um, pieces by Shapiro, you see how he directs his attention exactly to those kinds of examples uh, where the artist inhabits, so to speak, paint, texture, the, the artwork. And Derrida is in a way indifferent to that. Mm -hmm. uh, Derrida is very smart, of course, and he's not indifferent and he's completely sensitive to the fact that the whole historical issue is at stake there. And he even brings it up, the fact that Heidegger was a Nazi and that perhaps there's a different kind of a political agenda underlying this kind of aggressiveness on Shapiro's part. But instead of, of, of embracing that or of making room for that, he, he Derrida thinks that it kind of weakens uh, Shapiro's position, and he refuses. It's interesting that uh, uh, he refuses to see uh, what it means to speak from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll jump in now, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, Hagi. That was um, really, as Karen said, there's a lot to unpack there, and I'm really pleased that this was the the paper that rounded off the day because I think it gets at the core of what we've been trying to do which is read Shapiro to use Oliver's phrasing anew today right to read him through the contemporary moment and I think that actually what your paper pulled at and what this debate really gets at is the obstacle so Oliver Ali was talking about the obstacle for reading Shapiro today is the way that he's been taken up by academic Marxism. I think the obstacle that you were really dealing with is postmodernism and actually the way in which postmodernism has received Shapiro. Now, when I reread the text, I really just read it through that contemporary moment of seeing Shapiro in 1968, which is obviously significant, um, as um, putting forth a critique of the postmodernism that was already there or stirring or was to be. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that 
um, Derrida takes up this debate, and I definitely don't think it's a coincidence that Jameson then takes up um, the reading, Heidegger's reading of the shoes and forgets Shapiro, because obviously that's the important reading for Jameson. Um, and again, it just feels very relevant to our discussion today, which has been about looking and about aesthetic experience. And obviously Shapiro's primary complaint with Heidegger is his lack of looking. He didn't look, he didn't know, he wasn't exactly sure at the time of writing which Van Gogh it was. And that was, that was Shapiro's complaint because he was, as we've mentioned a few times today, invested in a certain modernist idea of aesthetic experience and of looking. Um, and another way in which it, just another thing to add on is uh, something that's so poignant in Oliver's book, which is the way in which Shapiro thinks with these interlocutors and the way that he understands his own thinking by almost disagreeing or having these what Oliver calls critical debates with other people. And I guess the kind of latent critical debate that's happening in the Heidegger Shapiro debate, and I would push back on your characterization of it not quite being a debate, I do think he has something um, critical to say, is his critique of postmodernism or the postmodernism that would, would become and for whom Heidegger would, of course, be very important. Um, so I guess my question is, you talk about rehabilitating Shapiro, and Oliver talked about renewing, uh, reading him anew. And I guess my question is, to what extent do we have to overcome the uh, legacy of postmodernism in order to return legibility to Shapiro? So thanks a lot for your comment slash question. I think you 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 really understood what I, I tried to to say. And um, first about the question of looking, I completely agree with you that for Shapiro, Heidegger's problem is not just the misidentification of the shoes or not that he, there was something that he couldn't see on a particular moment, but that he's a philosopher that doesn't look. Philosopher that allows himself to talk about the visual without looking. So that, that is a very good point. Now, I, I think that you also write that it's somehow not coincidental that we're talking about 68 and the world is changing Politics is changing, philosophy, theory is changing, art history is also changing, and the practice of art itself is changing. And and I I when when I use the word rehabilitation, I don't remember if you remember my I don't if you remember my qualification there, I'm not interested in rehabilitating Shapiro per se. I'm interested in kind of integrating him into a moment or a, what I call the hermeneutics of restitution that is interested in the whole kind of move that takes us to where we are today in a way that allows us also to come to terms with roads not taken or with junctions where certain decisions were made and others were kind of pushed to the side. And I think that part of the, one of the main problems today for theory is that we have become completely forgetful of those junctions. And, and in this sense, Shapiro for me opens up this landscape. I have one quick thing to say and then I'll turn it over to Johannes for your question. But I just noticed that um, there's this passage in the, one of the texts that you had us read, Hagi M. Cezanne, where where Shapiro says, speaking about Feuerbach, he says, a true philosopher does not have a philosophy. What a philosopher does is philosophize, examine, question, investigate, seek consistency, discover inconsistency. To claim for himself a complete or perfect system is not a philosophical attitude. Um, and I think that's a, a quite remarkable um, quote from Shapiro, especially in relation to this Chloe's comment about 
postmodernism and Shapiro's modernism and how one, one of the things I've kind of thought in a certain crude way, I suppose, is that often under the postmodernist lens and certainly as I read Derrida and many of the other commentators on Shapiro through Derrida, they almost treat Shapiro as if he didn't have a theory, right? You see that in Mitchell's comment. It's, it's not theoretical at all. It's atheoretical as if positivism, if Shapiro is a positivist, which I'm not totally sure he is, at least in all understandings of the term, as if that's not a theory, but of course it's a theory. And one of the remarkable things I think about Shapiro's theory is precisely this emergent quality that he was very, very willing, right, to, re to, to engage in a kind of revisionary practice. And even in the, the debate with Heidegger, right, in the second note, um, that he publishes in 1994, um, and then even in the in the first note when he republishes in 1994 the note from 68, he actually revises his text, revises that text to be more subdued, less um, less less assertive, less authoritarian than it was in the original text. And to a certain extent, I think that kind of reveals something quite deep about Shapiro's own views. Um, that well, I guess that's more of a comment than a question. And now. I'll turn it over to Johannes for a question. Just a quick response. I think you're completely right. To say that Shapiro is not theoretical is absurd. In many ways, he's much more theoretical than Mitchell. In the, in, at least in the old sense of what theory is. And this kind of leads us to, or, or shows us the need to reflect again on what, what on this strange word theory and how it's used and what, what are its parameters and limitations, etc. Yeah, um, it's interesting too. And I know Kamini just hosted a CAA panel called After Theory, which was quite interesting to listen to the papers too. Um, uh, so I wonder if she has any comments about this at all, but um, I'll turn it over to Johannes now. Thank you. Um, yeah, just. Uh, on a quick note first, on a quick note on, on Mitchell, I think Mitchell's comment on Shapiro might have much more to do with Mitchell himself than it actually says about Shapiro. So to, I would say it isn't so much about Shapiro's resistance to philosophy, but it is about Mitchell's resistance to art. And in a certain way, that takes me immediately to what I would like to say. First, Hagi, thank you so much. And I absolutely would like to second your proposal to take Shapiro or to take Heidegger out of the text and therefore to take Shapiro out of that alleged debate. And you did that in a certain way. And I want to do it again by stating the obvious by simply saying that Shapiro, of course, is an art historian. And I would briefly like to say or to unpack what I want to say by that and what I mean. Oli, I, I was surprised or found it peculiar that probably the first question of the day that you brought up was, what could science be? And for Shapiro, visual arts would be key to that. And I think if we speak about Shapiro, maybe we actually have to turn that question around. And of course, we have to ask, what could art be? And probably science is key to that for Shapiro. And I think Karen's comment and also Karen's referencing for Sillon was in a certain way also pointing into that direction. And when we think now about Shapiro's text on Heidegger, it is again the question, what is Shapiro's interest? And is his interest philosophy or is his interest in an, as an art historian, first and primarily art, which we simply have to maybe assume. But of course, I mean, you do not have to concentrate only on art as an art historian, but it is part of your practice, isn't it? Thinking about art. And so what I find so, I mean, it's also a very ironic text, isn't it? Because Shapiro, what he's doing is he's acting as a very conventional art historian by doing something that is part of an art historian's practice. A philosopher has written a text, has referenced a painting, an artwork, and Shapiro tries now to uncover what artwork this was or might have been. So in a certain way, I think of Nicholas Cusano's Divisione Dei and the portrait that he is referencing in that treatise. And generations of art historians have thought about what portrait this might have been. So this is a very conventional thing for an art historian to do. And 
I just want to emphasize that again, because in a certain way, I thought it was so interesting. We, throughout the afternoon, we discussed uh, Shapiro in science, Shapiro in drawings, and now Shapiro in philosophy. But all this is, of course, about Shapiro and art and Shapiro as an art historian. And so especially in that text, in the Heidegger text, I think it is, of course, far from being accidental that Shapiro at the end actually hands over to Gauguin. And no matter whether that makes sense or not, within the text itself, that has, of course, a function. So instead of giving the last word to Heidegger, he's giving the last word to another artist. And so this text is, in fact, very much about the autonomy of art and the autonomy of the artist as the practitioner of art. Yeah, so it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's more of a comment. It is not more of a comment, it is only a comment. But thank you so much for, for everything. Thank you for the wonderful comment. I think it's it's really interesting. And I mean, I think the next, say, um, the next part of this workshop should be dealing with exactly with what art history means for, for Shapiro. And clearly he wants an uh, autonomy for it. And when you see his reactions to philosophy that come clear in, in this text on Cezanne, for example, it's really sometimes surprising. It's as if, yes, art history, of course, has its own autonomy, philosophy has its autonomy, and but they, they cannot intersect in any deep sense. So you can draw comparisons, find kinds of maybe certain terminology that appears here and there, but it doesn't seem that he thinks of them, say, as, as Deleuze thinks or, or Merleau-Ponty, as two branches of the same thing or two dimensions of the same thing, our being in the world. So no, it's first of all an, a, a discipline that is autonomous, that is a domain of, of knowledge, of practice that uh, philosophy is foreign to, yes, and philosophy is the same. Is it my turn now? Yes. <laughs> It is your turn, yes, Maggie. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, no, I haven't forgotten. I, I always have um, mixed feelings when philosophers or psychoanalysts discuss pictures. Um, you know, one doesn't want to be siloed in one's disciplines, <laughs> and they often have quite interesting things to say, but they always do make the work of art exemplary of a theory or illustrate or even decorate <laughs> what they're saying you know it's an instrumental use of a picture and you know I'm not just putting this on to you know people outside the discipline because with the rise of theory and you're looking at one uh, <laughs> um, you know there's also a danger that we do it ourselves as art historians and I have a uh, interesting theory and take a work of art to to illustrate it to exemplify the theory and in, in, instead of starting with the work of art and seeing it as a mode of thought and trying to draw out what what the what the thinking is intrinsic to uh, the work rather than you know needing these theoretical props from outside Anyway, that would be ideal. <laughs> no, I, I completely agree with you. I, I hope you don't think that I've talked about a artwork in this way because I didn't speak of an artwork today. I spoke of the debate. And oh, no, I, I, I found it inspiring what you were saying, yes. No, I, no I'm, I'm just saying that methodologically, <laughs> I of course think that I, I agree with you about the need to begin with the work of art if you're talking about works of oh. art. Mm -hmm. At the same time, and, and I'm also kind of um, aversive in many ways to, to the to ways of doing theory or philosophy in relation to art, where art only becomes an instrumental or kind of a device to, to illustrate a theory. And the question is precisely how to give, to allow autonomy on the one hand, and to allow dialogue between those different voices and allow them to intersect in inter interesting ways. And, um, 
And I think here one, we should also question our assumptions. For example, this divide between that we talked about between the discursive and the, and the visual, visual food is much more, you can't just hold a kind of a simple opposition there, right? I think you were also saying that in a way. So, so yes, I, I agree with you that, and I think here Deleuze is very important um, in thinking of art as a mode of thinking that is irreducible to theoretical thinking. Um, I think now maybe it's comedy. Did you have a, a question? I see your hands raised. Um, yes, can you hear me? Um, so uh, this is all really fascinating and, um, and, and thank you so much, Heggy, for that really insightful paper because I think it really, I, I particularly like this idea of how to, the re rehabilitating a thinker as active, not reactive, where that means rethinking him in terms of this hermeneutics of restitution that is both in, sort of enlightening the disjunctions and blind spots in parallel discourses that that challenges the, any supposed either hegemony of any discourse over the other or discipline or their supposed autonomy such that the distinctions of art historian philosopher theorist uh, uh, have to be rethought um, in relation to each other um, and I think your paper gets to the core issues of the running through the symposium and one is on the relation between theory and philosophy um, and uh, which is very live in my mind and probably Oliver's as well um, from yesterday's conference um, and how the, you know Mitchell, Mitchell might be speaking and Derrida might be speaking here of um, an aspect of theory after um, theories sort of post-structuralist moment that is not just about the theoretical in terms of either self-reflexivity of a discourse or appeal to concepts or systems of concepts or a science of, or a second science or something like this, which we know Shapiro obviously does, and he is obviously a theoretical thinker, but he might not be one who is uh, operating theoretically after theory. Um, and one way of thinking that might be in relation to the presuppositions of his discourse um, and the presuppositions and givens of his own thoughts and discourses. Um, and I think this is where Derrida's criticism of Shapiro are still alive in the sense of, you know, what's at stake here is that Shapiro assumes he knows what is at stake in painting or discourse. Um, and by the way, I, I think this is a very interesting in relation to Oliver's remark on revisions because surely one can revise one's positions whilst nevertheless holding presuppositions about the kind of groundwork of your position. So we have to sort of think about, you know, and when he talks, Shapiro does talk about philosophy in terms of ground, a grounding system. I can't remember which text this is, but he, he criticizes the kind of appeal to lots of different theories and philosophies and instead saying, well, none of them actually restitute, have a sort of groundwork, philosophy as groundwork. So this is obviously a very particular idea of philosophy that he has. So I think there's this overdetermination. Um, I'd like to hear you more, to speak more about uh, philosophy, science and art, um, which is over, seems to be overdetermined by a debt to a certain notion of philosophy and philosophy of science. Um, and this idea, which is it manifests in Cezanne and the philosophers of the philosopher of so, as someone who employs the medium of language, engages construction of value and presents ideas in discursive form. Um, you know, none of those, uh, and you have to correct me if I'm wrong here, but none of those sort of definitions seems to be deconstructed. They're kind of somehow upheld in order to be moved around <laughs> or shifted around, but they're, they're not deconstructed. And then science is somehow depending on, um, or in debt still to ideas of observation, logical analysis and verification, and art is bearing a personal dimension, even if that personal, the notion of the personal is made spectral in a really interesting way, Huggy, that brings Shapiro into contact again with Derrida's notion of spectral identity. But I don't think it's necessarily the definitions or associations that are the problem, but the positing of them as givens. 
Uh, and this brings me back, sorry, I'm getting long, but back to the previous presentation um, uh, and the, over, the question of the overdetermination of the cult of experience, Oliver, and even experimental itself with the, 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 the apparent self-sufficiency of discourse. So in on some problems, we have problems of the non-mimetic and the image sign return to, or perhaps never allowed to escape from a holistic framework of intelligibility for representational and non-representational art. That is the visible and the linguistic are in my reading of this, <laughs> return to a single frame, the epistemic. So the thing that resists inte the intelligibility of a given framework to begin with, say of a certain approach to form and analysis, the non-mimetic is made legible and returned to the representation of Shapiro's discourse. Isn't this a way in which the practice of discourse remains logocentric rather than say, and this is just two things occurring to me, becoming materialistic or even imagistic? And isn't this one way, of course, where Shapiro diverges from feminology than the way, you know, um, Huggy is talking, talking about, about 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 the body, um, uh, for instance, which does, which doesn't feature in this in this text at all. So, um, and I think something happens in the which is similar in the Wittgenstein essay. The hegemony of representation seems to overdetermine the idea or the experience of drawing. So, in order to draw both known and unknown objects, the artist does not need to know what they are but to reproduce the appearance of their form, which is a sentence that kind of indicates that the notion of drawing is overdetermined as reproduction in the sphere of the visible. Uh, but what happens, for instance, when we put that in contact with, you know, like Derrida's notion of drawing as blindness, or, you know, that have no relation to model, but only to memory. Um, again, another way to think about what happens to resti the restitution or, Shapiro after Derrida. Um, so I'm kind of wondering, you know, where does the non-mimetic figure in the, the non-mimetic as it figures in the production of artistic work, figure in the demand that it places on the discourse of the art historian or their thought or even their writing, such that they can't no longer sort of proceed in a tone of certainty? How does drawing itself interrupt that self-sufficiency authority of of discourse. So in that sense, I'll come to an end. The final paragraph of some problems I just thought was quite interesting when I reread it right now, because it, it seems to posit point to this possibility of a schism between Shapiro's own discourse and the artwork as one model of a contemporary thought. That was a quote, which brings him, I think, into interesting conversation again. Um, I agree with you, Huggy, with Deleuze, surprisingly. Um, and and I don't think his notion of the ideal of Auden's fruitless position is something to be focused on, but what he his last sentence, the open, unbounded, and contingent as a whole. And I'm and I find that very interesting as a possibility of a kind of maybe gesture towards when the legibility of the image breaks down and the possibility of the autonomy of the art historian's own discourse is challenged by the object that is that is um that it's confronted with. Sorry, that was very, very long, but uh, I, I don't know. Um, I wonder what, how Shapiro would answer such a question. Um, because, right, we're already speaking in a different language. And I think that, um, well, I'll, I'll just pick up a few themes in what you said. I think that it's okay to say that, that Shapiro was a logocentric uh, thinker. Yes, he was a logocentric thinker. He believed in logos in the kind of rational sense of the word. He thought that if you cannot kind of talk in a jargonic way, if you have ideas, you have to, to, to give it, to kind of explain them. You have to argue for them, to argue for them rationally, all kind of that, the, the kind of old, old or high modernist, uh, modernist and high modernist discourse is is Shapiro definitely, and we're no longer there, and we're no longer there also in terms of what phenomenology was about in terms of 
presence that is primordial or that is at least primal, the primacy of perception, et cetera, et cetera. Now think of our condition now with the pandemic, kind of screens have become our, our, our framework and we see each other kind of through those boxes and we, we lose touch with space, with mutual space. The whole question of what it means to relate to the other is kind of fractured. We live in a different world than the one Shapiro lived in. And yet there are a lot of uh, similarities and continuities. And so in, in this sense, I think the, the point is how to engage with this otherness. It's a, it's a question of otherness that is there, which we can engage with. And of course, Shapiro didn't have, I don't know what he would have thought about, say, Derrida's difference or his concept of writing. I mean, that would probably be very foreign to him and less explained in some very specific way that he could then say it's like he says about Benjamin, that it's, it's compatible with logical positivism. I don't know. I, I, but what comes to mind here is this very beautiful quote that Oliver brought at the beginning of his uh, talk about the relationship to other cultures. And right, he said there was something about thinking kind of being in the circle of understand of, of being satisfied with understanding another culture means you you're outside of this culture and the idea is to engage with it so so i think that that shapiro was a person who called us to engage with things he engages with the artwork he engages with people he cares about people and and i i think that one of one part of his leg legacy is to is one is a call for us to engage with him, to be open to what is no longer part of our world, but has to do with the roots of who we are. So that's where I'm standing more or less. I, I take, for example, you mentioned Derrida, for example, in his work on blindness. Take his take Derrida's take text on the on the on memoirs of the blind. The, the, right, the, the exhibition he created in the text. Can you say that Derrida understands about the visual as Shapiro does? I think it's clear that Derrida doesn't, apropos not looking, Derrida's, uh, Derrida is very sophisticated on many levels that have to do with language, but when it comes to the visual, Derrida is kind of quite mediocre, I think. Could I say something as tight as that? Yes. Please, Sarah. Yeah, I was going to, I was, I, the thing I like most about your talk, Huggy, I don't, well, when, which I retain visually as well, is the tenderness of the little vase of blossom by Van Gogh and the relationship with the photo, um, the, 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 the photo by Goldstein. And um, I just wanted to say, I also sympathize with the person who said that Mitchell is really writing about Mitchell, because there is this idea of, of people's careers and agendas. And what I wanted to say is I worked on, on a Derrida's very, very last text, because obviously he may be wanting to be a bad boy and jump in with the big guys and quote Heidegger and practice de tournament and so forth in Macula. But at the very end of his life, when he's got cancer and cannot even sign his name because he's trembling so much, he writes the most beautiful text for Adami, for whom he's been writing all his life since the 1970s. And he talks about the voyage of drawing, the autobiographical gap between what is seen and what is written about it and what is really going on, and elective affinities. And he ends up with the phrase, the psyche between friends. So that in the end, he comes full circle. He's not writing again, of course, about Heidegger and Schuess and Shapiro, but he comes full circle back to your very, um, um, in the, 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 the uh, not just friendship, but of course, intersubjectivity uh, between people. And also I do believe when I talked about in, uh, empathic, subject, uh, empathic projection, the fact that art history is also an exercise a futile exercise of intersubjectivity with, with dead speakers. So that I just wanted to 
um, you know, make a little claim for a later uh, and possibly uh, not necessarily chastened, but different Derrida who respects the same things and the same concept of friendship and the psyche between friends as Mayor Shapiro. I, I completely agree. I think the, I think Derrida, I mean, the, the last writings of Derrida are ethical, very much so. And he also has this um, very nice small book on, on photography, Ath Athens uh, still remains on, what is the name of this French photographer? I uh, can't remember. I forget now too, but uh, um, definitely I completely agree with what you say. I think um, unfortunately we're well over time and we do need to hand the Courtauld Zoom back to the Courtauld, back to the research forum. Um, I think that was a very productive conversation. Um, and I think it was really rewarding uh, for everyone, certainly very rewarding for me. And um, I'd just like to thank everyone for participating, for raising the questions, for criticizing Shapiro. Um, there's lots of room for that. And I tried to bring some of that in early, um, uh, but also for trying to think with him and to think through him um, in our current moment. Um, so thank you again for everyone at all. Maybe thank turn you. it back to David. Very much. Thank, that was you. Magnificent. thank you. Just what we ought to be doing here. Thank you.